really good to have all of you here with us. I know you've been receiving a lot of emails, so thank you for uh, not sending any nasty ones back about the number. <laughs> um, just to let you all know, so the, um, there's a few different restrooms. If you go just around the corner to the front of the building, there's uh, ladies and gentlemen's bathrooms there. Um, we'll be having a coffee break in about an hour, hour and a half and then we'll be having lunch for all the registered participants. Um, just before we get started, I'd like to say thank you to everyone, both from Sea Grant and from near CTP for helping set up. Um, definitely takes a village. Also, um, big thanks to uh, the city of Slidell and um, the people that run this venue and the mayor of Slidell especially. Um, they have helped prepare this room, but also give us this room for free, which is really nice. Uh, and also to our guest speakers for their generosity of time in preparing their, their presentations and also for driving and flying all the way from places like Georgia and Florida. Um, it's, it's really great to have you all here. Um, I'd like to ask the, uh, the near CTP people to uh, take a moment to, to talk about their program. That's right, if Jacqueline or Holland, one of you wanna sure. say something. Um, And we're happy to be partnering with Emily and C. Grant in Louisiana because it's the only state where there's not a National History Research Reserve, so thank you. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so that's the, the CTP which we've partnered with to help bring you this, this uh, set of uh, presentations today. Um, so, as you may have already realized, I'm with the C. Grant Gomery Outreach Program, and um, yeah, I just want to tell you a little bit about that before we start everything off today so that you have a little bit of context for why we're having this. Um, given the, the, the makeup of this audience, just from looking at all the registration forms, it seems like you're probably all really familiar with uh, Deepwater Horizon, so there's no need to go into that. But um, what about some of the, the, the organizations that are trying to bring science to, to people? And that's, I represent one of those groups. So, um, Sea Grant, there's a Sea Grant in the Gulf of Mexico, four programs, Texas, Florida, Louisiana, and Mississippi and Alabama share a program. And then there's also this entity, Gomery, the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative, which you may or may not be familiar with. Hopefully within the next 15 minutes you will be. <laughs> um, so who is Sea Grant? Sea Grant, um, there's 33 programs nationwide, and I like to tell people that if there's a big body of water, whether it's uh, an ocean or a Great Lake, or in our case, the Gulf of Mexico, there's probably a Sea Grant program near you. And as I mentioned, there's four of them in the Gulf region alone. Um, we have a history of more than 40 years serving this, this region, and um, we're both federally and state funded through NOAA and through the states. Um, we're non-advocacy, so that means that, you know, we, we try to bring you the best available science, but we don't tell you what to think one way or another. We're non-regulatory. In some circles, we're known as the honest broker. So we, we give you this information. We say, okay, take it. You make up your mind what you think should be done with it. Uh, we have three areas of emphasis, one of which is extension, which is what we're doing today. We take uh, research from the lab, from the scientists who are doing it, and we extend it to you. So, we paired up with Gomery. Um, Gomery is the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative, and as you may or may not be aware, it's uh, a $500 million investment over a 10-year period from BP from non-penalty funds. Um, and as you can see, it's, uh, it's already funded a great deal of research, more than $330 million worth of money has already been allocated to research projects and outreach efforts. Um, 565 publications, um, 600 something data sets. A lot of information is out there because of Gomery. And so we partnered with them to try to help deliver oil spill science information to people. And the, the goal of Gomery is really to help people um, 
um, understand and better deal with Deepwater Horizon, whether that's better responding to oil spills or just understanding how it's breaking down in the environment and how it's going to affect people and fisheries, um, habitat, things of that nature. So Gomery has five focus areas, um, areas that they, they fund their research. So understanding the fate and transport of oil and dispersants, uh, understanding the chemical and biological breakdown of those oil and dispersant mixtures and what are the, um, the toxicological effects. Uh, understanding the health and environmental effects as well. Um, technology developments um, in terms of improved response and how to better mitigate the oil spill, um, and also understanding the public health implications. So what are the socioeconomic impacts? What are, what's the community capacity like um, in terms of bouncing back from a spill? So there's a couple of tools that Gomery has that I'd like to tell you about before um, we get into stuff. And these are some tools that you can go home and use right away. These are free and they're available on the Gomery website. So the first one is called Grid C, and this is a, a database. So one of the stipulations of Gomery funding is that if you receive money for your research grant, you have to put your data set on this database and make it publicly available. So there's a lot of um, transparency here. So if you go to the webpage, this is what you see. You can search for data, you can submit data if you're a researcher. Um, you can see there's a lot of data sets, more than 600, and it includes more than 221 projects. So a lot of information is out there already. I like to tell people that we don't know everything about the spill, but we definitely know a whole lot more than we did five years ago. And a lot of that information is publicly available because of, of things like Grid C. Um, so if you, for example, if you go onto this, this database and you, you type in the word marsh, um, this is sort of what you, you end up with. You can see, um, you can search through the different projects according to the year that they were funded or the, the grouping of grants that they came with. And then you can get all these different uh, outputs, all the different projects that are associated with the word marsh. Then, for example, um, this was one of the projects that I pulled up, not to put Deepak on the spot, but um, his project came up, and so you can see the point of contact, you can um, get the email address for the person who loaded the data set, um, there's date, metadata available, you can read the abstract, like what kinds of data there is, so before you start downloading stuff, you have an idea of what you're getting yourself into. Uh, and then lastly, you can download it. And I actually did try to download it and you get this really nice Excel file with all the data neatly managed and you know you can see what's out there. So it's very transparent, very easy to use and I encourage you all to take a look. Um, the next thing is the Gomery Publication Database. And so um, again, you can go on there, type in keywords, say wetland, and then you'll get all kinds of publications coming up and you can sort them according to year and different things that you're interested in and <coughs> there are further search filters. So it's a really good um, resource, particularly given um, y'all's line of work. It's, it could be very useful. So those are things that Gomery is doing on the research end. But once you have this research, right, you don't want it to just sit on a shelf somewhere and languish. You want it to get out to the public. You want it to get out to people who could use it, right, um, in their day-to-day -day jobs. So um, Gomery has funded a, several research consortia, each of which have their own outreach efforts. And they've also funded all kinds of other outreach um, activities, which I'm not going to list them all, but you can see some of them here. And one of those is the Gulf of Mexico Sea Grant Program's oil spill outreach team, which I'm a member of. Um, so we're not looking to compete with any of these other existing outreach efforts, but we, we try to complement them as best we can. So with this oil spill outreach program that Sea Grant has come up with uh, when partnering with Gomery, it consists of four specialists. Uh, one of which is me, and uh, one coordinator. And so going from west to east, we've got Christine Hale at Texas Sea Grant, and um, she specializes in Gomery theme area three, environmental health effects. Uh, I'm in Louisiana, Louisiana Sea Grant in Baton Rouge, and I look at theme two, understanding the chemical and biological um, impacts of Deepwater Horizon. 
Larissa Graham is at Mississippi Alabama Sea Grant and she um, focuses on theme area three public health. And then finally we have Monica Wilson at Florida Sea Grant and she looks at more of the fate and physical transport of oil and dispersants. And um, then finally we have Steve Sempier who's in here. I can't find him, he's somewhere here. <laughs> he's been running around, oh there you are, uh, a lot. Um, so he's, you know, we have this big regional effort. We work not just within our each of our home states, but we also work regionally as well. And so when you have that kind of um, four person, interdisciplinary, crazy team, you need someone that can kind of keep everything coordinated and the effort all going in the same direction. So that's what Steve does for us. So, um, so who do we work with? We work with our, um, audiences that Sea Grant has traditionally worked with and we just sort of um, extend those bonds to now include oil spill outreach as well. So as you can see um, here, we work with a pretty diverse bunch of people and we've uh, in total regionally met with more than 600 people from those target audiences. And in those meetings, we try to assess what things they're interested in, but also what sorts of oil spill things um, they would have wanted to know five years ago. What would have helped you do your job better during the spill? Um, so actually, at the end of today's session, we're gonna be doing um, an input session, which I really hope that you all take part in because um, we wanna get to know you better. We want to better understand uh, what kinds of things you need to know on your job, what will help you do your job better and how can we get that information to you in the best possible way. Um, also, if you open up your folders, uh, just behind your agendas, there's an input and evaluation form, like a short form of it, and I'm hoping that you'll also fill that out and place it in the basket back there at the registration desk um, before you leave here today. Okay, so as I mentioned before, this, this specialized oil spill team um, we are trying to get oil spill science out there to different groups of people. And one of those ways that we're doing that is through um, things like publications, through outreach publications. And um, here are a couple of examples of ones that are coming out soon. Uh, we have understanding the effects of Deepwater Horizon on seafood, uh, understanding the impacts on fisheries and fisheries management. So these are just a couple of topics that touch on subjects that from the 600 something people that we've talked about, these are issues that people really care about. So those are a couple of examples. Uh, we also do other types of outreach things as well, which I'll talk about in a second, but really at the heart of all of our, our outreach efforts really is that we use only peer reviewed uh, published science. So it's not hearsay, it's not something that you see on the news necessarily, it's all um, you know rigorously tested peer-reviewed published science. And that's what you're gonna be hearing today from our guest speakers. Um, and I think that's a really important point. So in addition to those outreach publications, we also do uh, organize science seminars like the one you're at here today um, with experts in their fields. So you're hearing it firsthand from the scientists themselves, what they found. And also, um, we're doing these, these uh, input sessions to try to gauge what you care about. So lastly, I'd like to, to let you know that um, we do have this webpage, if you're not already familiar with it, and we constantly update it with upcoming presentations, um, information about upcoming publications. Uh, so if you wanna stay in the loop, and if you're not already on our email list, um, please send me an email visit our website, check it out. There's a lot of good information there. Okay, so with that, I'd like to ask Dr. Twilley to come up as our guest speaker. Thanks, Emily. Uh, good morning. Um, just a few comments before I get into my remarks. Uh, one aspect of the comments from Emily that I'm, I just want to highlight, uh, you know, this oil spill as well as we're about to celebrate the anniversary of Katrina and Rita uh, hurricanes in 2005, 
Uh, we, you know, is this whole sense of uh, regionalism, uh, how we work together from a Gulf of Mexico regional concept, and this. Uh, this sort of experiment, if you will, of the, the different uh, Sea Grant programs putting together this one cohesive and coherent uh, sort of approach to uh, working together in outreach uh, across the entire Gulf of Mexico, splitting up into different disciplines, but then trying to be one uh, unit that helps with the outreach program. It's actually been a very interesting, and I applaud Steve and the group uh, with what they've been able to do. And, and also the NAIRS program, you know, uh, you've been doing the same thing, bringing your groups together. Uh, so I hope some of my comments actually reinforce why that's so important um, relative to uh, the issue that we deal with. Uh, so I was asked uh, in 15 minutes, and I can look at my watch here, so people know me, that's gonna challenge. Uh, and uh, so in 15 minutes to sort of reflect, uh, so this is really not based on any publications per se, but. Uh, some of my experiences uh, related to uh, this, uh, uh, the, to the Deepwater Horizon. I know we're not to spend time on this, but I, I do just want to reemphasize this begin April 20th. Uh, the Monday of that week, I was actually appointed uh, part-time chief scientist for CPRA in Louisiana. 50% of my time from LSU was dedicated to CPRA. Bad timing. Uh, Friday of that week, we're in the midst of the largest oil spill in the history uh, of, the, of the U.S. And so, uh, part of my comments are going to be based on uh, my reflections uh, relative to uh, this experience, and and uh, some of the aspects I think hopefully will will help support some of the discussion. So, I'm going to talk about. Uh, how we changed our thinking to a certain degree and the, and the role of an event like this as well as the hurricanes that make us think about uh, the, the ecosystem itself and how we manage the ecosystem and how we describe and actually do outreach about this ecosystem. So here's an image and this is a, a first image we sort of ran to uh, uh, first 48 hours following the spill. And what you'll notice in this image is, is that it, it, relative to how all may, you know, bait and transport and effects is totally uh, inaccurate related to what really is uh, the, the source of uh, the oil, not from the surface, but from the bottom. And so this whole idea of actually how to deal with the spill uh, within the first 48 hours uh, uh, sitting up in the CPRA office, I got a call from a colleague from Alaska and started telling me exactly what my next two years were going to be like related to the paradigms of dealing with oil spill and recovery and lawyers and a whole bit. Well, I'm sorry, any lawyers out there. But, uh, but this was a major paradigm shift, this whole idea that, in fact, oil was released from the bottom, travels 5,000 feet. And the other aspect is that when it gets to the surface, it's different. It's, it's not refined oil. It's actually natural uh, uh, oil from the bottom. Uh, and the fact that the oil from the surface when it hits the shoreline is very different. I, there were some real rock stars, I think, in outreach. Ed Overton is one that I thought did a fabulous job of describing the fact of the constituents and how the chemistry of the oil changed from when it reaches the surface uh, to the time it hits the shoreline. The talks today, if I'm correct, are to focus on the shoreline and the wetlands. And so it's a very different aspect. But that was, th this is a simple diagram, but a major paradigm shift in how we think about oil and effect in, in the environment. Uh, so this, and again, this idea that the bottom uh, not only uh, sort of uh, challenged us related to how the whole chemistry and the effects and the fate uh, uh, in the transport in a system from deep water, uh, but it also uh, really changed our, our, our concept of uh, the ecological systems that it actually interacts with. And one of the toughest parts was tracing it. You know, the whole idea of the fate related to the fact that what we see on the surface is just a small portion of what actually uh, is, 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 may have been uh, released. Second, the other aspect that really I think was a major paradigm shift, and again one that I was personally involved with, is this idea of the connection between the shelf and the shoreline. Uh, I remember two years before the oil spill trying to get funding uh, for a group of modelers, coastal modelers, uh, at LSU to actually look at transport mechanisms from the shelf up into the estuaries. In fact, was told, well, no, really we don't need that because there is no interaction between the shelf to the shoreline 
and the estuaries, and that there are two separate aspects. And this idea of fine-scale modeling using FVCOM, for example, to get from the offshore deep water and, and transport mechanisms and interacts with the estuaries uh, was not of interest. But we learned that was one of the major, I think, paradigm shifts is this connection is something that far offshore at that depth can actually interact with the shoreline. So these ecosystems and the coupling and the, and the fate and, the, and we know many of you uh, Earls out there, the biology, we know there's these migratory patterns that, that connect these systems, but uh, water transport can move things around. And that was a major shift, and we had to explain that actually to the public, and that was a real challenge. Third, one of the biggest challenges I've found talking to the press and talking actually to the managers is trying to explain an oil spill that was occurring at one spot and translating that into ecosystem impacts across the Gulf of Mexico, when in fact, the Gulf of Mexico is probably one of the most diverse shorelines as far as ecosystem development of any shoreline compared to Atlantic or Pacific for sure. In fact, I'll put it up for a thousand mile shoreline, I'll put it up against any shoreline uh, uh, in, in the world related to its biodiversity. And the reason for that, just simply on the bottom right there, a simple diagram by Boyd that actually shows different uh, coastal setting types from deltas to estuaries to lagoons, and may I throw in there carbonate coral uh, environments that go from subtropical to warm temperate that actually go from wet to dry trying to say what oil is going to do to the ecosystems of the Gulf of Mexico is a real problem. And it just emphasize that again, is that we go from, in a short distance, from muddy coast to sandy beaches. And I can tell you, and most of you out there know very well, and I'm, I'm assuming that most of the publications will hopefully embrace, embrace this, that any generalization relative to the impacts of oil in the Gulf of Mexico ecosystems is a real challenge because of the way that these ecosystems, particularly just the microbial communities in a sandy beach versus a muddy environment, will actually interact and, and process oil. And then that also means recovery and restoration. You can't take one recovery and restoration approach, uh, and that's for, say, sandy beaches, and apply that to a muddy coast. So this idea and what we really struggled with uh, for the first uh, several weeks was how we actually try to articulate the different approaches related to what may be fate and effects and what should be a response when in fact you're moving across this diversity of, of shoreline. Fourth point, we're doing this, uh, or we're, we're, we're very, we're a working coast, we're a working gulf. Uh, just look at the commerce that moves uh, through the Gulf of Mexico. Just look at the oil and gas and energy, one-third of the domestic oil supply, and just look at the fisheries. Just take those three industries, just, and, and let's add refining, and make it four, okay? Four industries that, that rank globally and are of tremendous significance to the United States means that we have ecosystems that are in highly engineered landscapes. So when we talk about effects and the fate of oil, how do we put that in the context of a highly engineered landscape that's already under tremendous changes related to the way we change hydrology, build canals, uh, move sediment, add nutrients, connect it to a watershed that drains 41% of the uh, continental US, so that we are trying to add fate and effects on top of a well-stressed ecosystem that is highly engineered. How do you tease that out? How do you tell that story related to what uh, oil is going to do, related to what may be uh, uh, changes that are associated with other factors? Just let me give you an example uh, real quick here of some work that we've just finished and actually is in uh, publication just went to sustainability science. Here's a hydrologic basin of coastal Louisiana in the Delta, Mississippi River Delta. And you'll notice the distribution of sediment uh, in these basins and how uh, that distribution, again, is the byproduct of a highly engineered landscape, engineered to, prov to promote navigation and flood control. Now, what I'm going to show you are three curves. You can, if you can see this, it's a little complicated, but I have three lines. Uh, if you look up to the upper right, there's a green line of 2000, there's a yellow line, 1970, and a white line in 1930. 
These are actually isoclefts that Woody Gagliano published in 1970 that represent where the 50% where the interaction of marsh to water would occur in coastal Louisiana. So these are locations where 50% of the landscape of the coastal landscape is marsh, where 50% of that landscape is water. And what he did was he actually uh, took seven and a half minute quads from the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or, or USGS and took those quads and actually uh, the white line is calculated from that in 1930. He did this analysis in 1970, so the yellow line is uh, observation in 1970. So the yellow and white are based on real observations. 1970, he drew the yellow, the green line, excuse me, of what he anticipated would be the migration of that 50% marsh to water ratio by the year 2000. What that means is as that line moves inland, you're getting a higher percentage of water, right, compared to marsh because of the disappearance of the wetlands and the occurrence of water. So what I'm going to show you are three graphs where we uh, have the Coastal Studies Institute and a group at LSU. We've actually gone back and we've actually uh, wrote a program to actually query uh, images to actually check exactly how well uh, this model that Gagliano did. And now, since he predicted this observation in 2000, we actually have the luxury of testing it because we're here in 2015. So let's start. First, this is an image, and I'll show, explain this image. So I've superimposed first Gagliano's lines, his isoclasts, right? Now this is an image in 1932. Now the dark green means that there is higher amount of marsh compared to water. The light green means the marsh to water ratio is about 50% or less, and the black is 100% water. And you'll notice what's very interesting is that right around that 1930 yellow line pretty well fits this 1932 image. If you go to the 1973 image, and now we're referencing the 1970 yellow line of Gagliano, it's actually not so bad either that this comparison between the technique that Woody used and what we're using actually line up very well. But you can see the slight migration across the coast, Barataria Basin compared to Terrebonne, but very little migration in the chapel We we'll go to the next image. This is an image in 1999. So now we're looking at an image that actually Woody projected over a 30 year time frame. And, if, and for those, I don't have a point, well, I guess I do, right? This is a, so here's Terrebonne. What's very interesting, so here's his red line of 2000, and here's actually that marsh to water ratio of 50%. What's very interesting is Terrebonne actually response was greater than what Woody uh, suggested, uh, and, and Barataria is actually less than what Woody had projected. He had projected a, a line all the way up here in Barataria, and a higher migration rate, if you will, of water relative to marsh uh, in Breton Sound. When you look at the 2010 image, again, what you're seeing here is the Gulf of Mexico migrating inland, right, relative to marsh and converting wetlands to water. Look how much farther in Terrebonne, and again up in Barataria, slowly the Gulf of Mexico is migrating, uh, uh, actually slowly, at a relatively rapid pace, and I guess those are all relative terms we could argue about. But again, this point is that we are looking at, at any point in time, an event such as an oil spill in a highly engineered landscape that is dramatically changing. So again, how do we tell this story about oil when in fact we're do talking about an ecosystem that is drastically changing related to the way we manage and engineer uh, that landscape? Finally, my, my last comment is that one of the biggest struggles we had, and these are some images that are very dear or very uh, obvious to many of you is response and, and recovery and how we deal with the, the event while it happens. And we actually wrote up about a 15, 20 page, we being CPRA on behalf of the state, wrote up a, what we thought would be response recommendations uh, relative to the spill. And when it comes to individual species and particularly top uh, species in the food chain, 
uh, hands-on uh, responses were very effective, and those stories are, 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 have really caught the attention of the public. When it comes to actually the ecosystems and the marsh surface, this became really problematic, and that is this concept of do no harm. And I'm telling you, of, of, I, I guess of all the conversations I had during this bill, and for those of you who are involved in a response, I know it's an ex extremely sensitive topic, but this idea of actually what we physically do as far as cleanup versus what the ecosystem can do itself, I hope that actually is something that we can uh, work on and becomes a major part of the results of the research and the projects that are going on. My last point is where the oil is going to go and the geography of oil because where the new paradigms are going to be are going to be re related to where oil exploration goes. So what we learned from uh, an oil event here, uh, how well does that actually capture this idea that an event could happen further to the west? So let me just sum up. First, fate effects, new paradigms. Uh, again, from, this is uh, some, uh, release of oil from the bottom. Helping the Gulf of Mexico ecosystems from the shelf to the shore, Major paradigms uh, shift there. New paradigms, I'm sure, will be discovered, and this will be refined. Scaling the effects across diverse Gulf of Mexico ecosystems, telling that story of fate and effect when you can go from the muddy coast to a sandy beach and to a carbonate corals is a real challenge. Recovery in highly engineered landscapes, what is your baseline? From baselines to benchmarks, this is going to be a real challenge. And then finally, do no harm. How to reconcile response and how do we deal with the aspects of what ecosystems can do on their own versus how we actually should be actively uh, involved in remediation. Anyway, thank you very much. I hope some of those comments help you during the day. Thanks. <clears throat> year segments of funding from Gromery. There are about, at one time, 15 uh, individual institutions, 20, 26 uh, PIs on this, well funded, but there are a host of problems to look at from this. And so I'm going to skim over some of the results we have so far. And Dr. Roberts will talk about the biogeochemistry of the sediments and uh, the marsh system following me, I think. Sorry. So, the idea is we have the money from the, uh, from Galbraith, it's delivered to Lumcon and it's distributed to these uh, institutions which go from Witzel uh, to Louisiana. There's quite a few of them, and it's not just a Louisiana project. So, to start off with, uh, we normally think of oil as being a, um, well, oil. So it came here as moose, but if you look at what's in the water, you, you can't drive a small boat through the oil. Uh, Nancy went down and came up through oil, the moose, and had it in their hair. But if you take a normal sample, you, know, you wouldn't put it, your boat to have the uh, engine cooled with this moose. So generally, we don't sample moose at all. We sample the water. And there's hardly any oil in the water itself. There's no small droplets going around. Um, so for the... Uh, Offshore, before it came here, I'm going to show a bunch of these squares which uh, have what we expected before and what we found afterwards, and I'll have to skip over the details on these. But for phytoplankton community offshore, we have found, uh, we did have a baseline. That was one thing we pleaded with the funding agency before they started, which took about a year before we got money, was that we have to have a baseline to work on. And we didn't start off with a strong baseline, but offshore we did have 
the baseline of the phytoplankton community, and we did find through marker indices that there was an effect on the phytoplankton offshore. And so now we're testing that inshore to see if we can find the same markers. We did find offshore, of course, we had a hypoxy that year, and it was incessantly, you know, we had, I spent at least an hour every day with reporters, and they would say, well, how bad is hypoxia going to be because of BP oil spill? And I say, well, we don't know, but if you look at the, the ballpark, we don't expect to find much of an effect because the main driver is the Mississippi River. And they say, well, how bad is it going to be? And I said, we don't expect any effect. Well, does that mean it's going to be huge? And we go over this again and again, and then they'd hang up on you. So we did find, maybe in two stations, some effect of carbon oxidation on the off offshore area. Well, we really didn't find any difference in the hypoxia zone offshore that summer in August than we did any other year. It was driven by the regional effect. So now inshore, which will consist of most of my focus here, there was the, these, if you're not familiar with these uh, graphs, these are uh, survey, uh, they're called scab analyses. And the, the red uh, is the hottest area of oil on the shoreline as they drive by and they go in and they have a protocol for that. And the blue means that basically uh, no, none at all. And you'll notice and a lot of the oil came into Barrateria Pass and turned right and oiled Bay Jimmy. But there are a lot of areas as well. So this was about, I think, 1,741 square miles of shoreline. It says nothing about how far in to the marsh it went. It just says that the shoreline was oiled. Now, if you drove by, you might confuse some of the oiling. I'm not saying they did, but if we drove by, you might see some of this dark area on the beach and you confuse the uh, rack with, with the oil until you go look at it. So they did a pretty good job, and they went through uh, multiple times over the next uh, three years uh, to look at how much oil was present in terms of being visibly present, but it was not measured. So if you look at the, where the, I'm gonna focus on this graph. If you look at the kilometers of shoreline, most of the marsh and was in Louisiana that was oiled. And this is the heavy, moderate, and light, and trace elements. So almost, you know, 80% or so of the oil shoreline or more was from Louisiana. So we have been looking at how much oil is in the marsh, and the pH is the main element or group of uh, uh, molecules that are uh, of concern. These are petroleum aromatic hydrocarbons. I've learned more chemistry than I want to know, <laughs> and probably you would want to know. But these are the aromatics which are uh, defined by individual test organisms often to be carcinogenic and harmful. And they represent about 5% perhaps of the total suite of molecules that are in the oil. Now m most of the, the lowest uh, one that we measure, and this is a common across many labs, is naphthalene. And when the oil came ashore, there wasn't much naphthalene in it. It had, it had blown off. So these are the, these mostly are heavier ones. So what's plotted here, and this is important, this is the baseline in red. We were able to get out there with no money and for anything. And, and guards on boats telling us not to do this or that. And we were able to sample a whole bunch of spots in the marsh, which we didn't know where the oil would have, end up. And we did get a baseline. And it's, I, I don't know why we did it. <laughs> well, I know why we did it, but it's, it's pretty remarkable that we got this done. And we used the same methods for many years after and are continuing them to look at how much oil is there now. And this is a log scale on the vertical. So what we have is down here is the alkanes, and, sorry, the alkanes and the aromatics. And the aromatics in the black. And the aromatics, I'd say, are the main thing. So this is a scale of 1, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. We had 100, you know, in the 10 to 100,000 range of increase in the amount of oil on the marsh on the average. The oil came ashore not as a blanket material. We have uh, one site, we have uh, 30, a spacing of 30 over, I don't know, 10, 10 miles, 5 miles, uh, samples. And you could go 10 meters away and you'd find no oil. We <laughs> had absolutely none. It was very spotty to begin with. Uh, it wasn't uh, a sheen of oil coming across on the marsh. 
And then we sampled into the marsh 100 meters. We didn't go any further, but we flew over. And we find just as much oil at one and 10 meters as you would far in, in the beginning. This is in the first few months. So it wasn't just an edge phenomenon. Perhaps it came up as a greasy moose in the first few, few meters, but it spread throughout the whole marsh. And it became obvious uh, after Isaac, which is a year, more than a year later, that the oil was lifted up from God knows where and brought into the marsh because the water level has a seasonal cycle where it's low during the winter and high in the summer, the end of the summer in particular. And a hurricane came up and rose the water, you know, two meters over the marsh. And it redistributed the oil and re-oiled the marsh again. So there were multiple oilings on this. And so, just draw this attention to you, is that it went from a baseline here and here up to there. It's at least 10 or 30 fold more. And that appears to be like the new baseline of oil for the marsh. Is that what we had as a baseline at one time from our, as Robert, uh, Dr. Twilley called it, uh, working coast, we have oil from a variety of sources, including the plants themselves, uh, but they are petroleum marketing arms. And we were able to identify the first oiling as Macondo. Now it's become aged and the molecules have changed and getting a signature for that definitively is, is difficult. But at any rate, the baseline has definitely risen. For all the marshes we sampled, and we're sampling uh, Terrebonne around just north of Cocodri, uh, on the east and west side of, um, no, sorry, we have east, east and west side of Barataria, including the Bay Jimmy here. So we're continuing, in short, basically uh, 13 sites uh, twice a year to go out as a group to go look at the marshes to see what's happened. And originally it was set up as an oil done oil set <laughs> uh, dichotomy, but it's turned out to be that a lot of the, the oil sites have become oil slated because the whole marsh has become, uh, I mean, the whole marsh of Paraterra Bay, as a salt marsh, has received the oil. And subsequent re-oilings, re they kind of get remixed within the marsh and among different marshes in the area. <coughs> So one aspect then was that we thought the oil would disappear rapidly. This does happen in Sandy Coast. It has happened elsewhere. These are microtidal coasts. Um, and we found out that it didn't. Uh, it retain, retain, it's been retained and it has dropped. It has gone down. It could be from mixing. It could be from dilution. It could be from decomposition. But at this point, it's definitely still there and it's going to be a lifetime of decades for some of this stuff to go back to a baseline if nothing else happens. <clears throat> it wasn't a single oiling, it was a single initial oiling, but there have been multiple oilings afterwards, each of which uh, perhaps is lower than the initial one, but is significant to the marsh. So two processes we saw on the edge of the marsh that we could describe from this oiling was that uh, first the initial oiling led to a collapse of the marsh in some places. Some places did other things. And so there's this general root structure underneath. These are organic soils for the most part in deltaic plains. They're not mineral matter. There is a tip on the delta around the river, around the Chafalaya, but in, in between are the Stelskaya plain. It's mostly organic matter. And the, the plant itself is buoyed up by this organic matter. And that was killed off, and so it sank in place. So it just dropped. The second aspect is that uh, there was an undercut. <coughs> the surface plant was okay, but somehow or another the uh, material at the edge, uh, in these marshes at least, was undercut. That was another mechanism. So what happens is the plant would be hanging out 30 to 40 centimeters at the most, and then it would separate off and fall in. It would be a live plant. It works photosynthetics, photosynthetically like a live plant, but it doesn't have a base beneath the 30, 40 centimeters below. Below them has just fallen off and going into it. Uh, and so what happens to the oil sites is that one of these secondary effects, and this is from Bay Batiste, um, is that if you have this spotty oiling coming, oiling coming in and it erodes it here, either from substance or uh, undercut, that leaves the protected areas that haven't been oiled as promontories. So over the next two years, these promontories are going to erode faster than they would otherwise. So you could slow down the oiling in the, in, in the inset part of it, but these promontories of healthy marsh are going to be attacked more strongly by the wave energy because it's going to hit them because they're sticking out. 
And so they erode faster. So that's, that's an indirect effect on it. And we, we didn't expect that, of course. So that's, that's something. And um, so on the expectations, we thought the restoration would be predictably successful, that erosion rates would be accelerated. They were accelerated up to three times faster for the first 18 months or so. Uh, and we're trying to figure out how, how long it's going to last before it goes back to baseline. Um, and there are these local effects from the, the spotty nature of the oiling on it. And the thing to point out about this is that the erosion is forever. We don't have any sites in, in general unless you treat them, as Dr. Zingle will talk about at the end. Uh, and most of these marshes, there's you know, too much area, will not be treated. And so the erosion is forever. It's not coming back. We found the places we looked, and we looked at a lot of places, they may have greened up for a while, uh, these subsidence sites, but they have not come back, and they're not going to come back. And so if you figure out how much uh, erosion rate uh, going up three times faster or twice as much for a year or two, you've got a lot of miles, miles that were of shoreline that were oiled. So it actually only ends up being a square mile per year. Right? That, that sounds like a lot to another state. To our state, it, it's still a lot. I don't want to lose one acre. But we permit that much every year. Every year, we grant a square mile of permitting. And for every mile of permitting, uh, there is an indirect effect from that permitting of about five. So we have a dramatic effect from the oil. It's significant, maybe a square mile, but we're also on the side, allowing that much to happen because it's legal. And so, on, so as uh, Dr. Twilley was saying, if you look at the erosion rates on our coast and you plan out the cumulative canal density in 15 minute quads, all the Delta 10 coast plots up really well with land loss and canal density. But on top of that, we've added uh, an oil spill effect. So to look at some of the effects of the oiling on the marsh itself, I'll go through some food web analysis. I won't go into the, what's, I'll, you're safe part. <laughs> so, uh, the oil has come ashore. Now, what, what's happened to the marsh because of that and what's happened in the water nearby? So, one thing on the microbial diversity, we, we didn't notice this. Other people are. There are quite a few other people out there with grants of various sorts. Well, one is the microbial diversity definitely uh, went down because of the oiling. Now, so what's happened is that the oiling has um, created a new niche of specialists for mostly oil or, or poison or made inaccessible for other type of microbes. And I just bring the, the, the oops, sorry. The, uh, geez, I'll never get this. So that's total pH is on the bottom. And it appears that the oil content now is below where that starts to drop off. So perhaps the microbial community, as a general rule, but not the individual cases of uh, microbial specialists, has reached uh, perhaps the baseline for, for this particular indice. It doesn't mean it's the same organ organisms. It only means that the genetic diversity has uh, come back up again. But it was definitely affected by this. That's from Atlas. Uh, he did his paper in environmental science and technology. So another thing is, on the oil, if you don't go out there, you may not realize you're surrounded by little critters besides crabs. There's ants, and there's, um, you know, there's stinging caterpillars. There's things you might not necessarily want to do if you go for recreational fishing. But there's lots of organisms out there, and one of them is inside the stem of the plant. And we found that uh, a few months after the spill, but not during the spill, the spill having ended in the fall, uh, the there actually was, there were a few, there were more oil, there were more ants in the oil sites than there were in the unoiled sites in September. But then after, in June, you can see the plots going across the top in time, gradually in uh, April 2012, which is two years later, there were no ants in the, in the marsh, in the oil sites. And now it seems to be that it may be coming back to, after three or four years of the ant community, just the these acrobat ants were coming back. <clears throat> the seaside sparrow is a resident uh, bird. It stays there 12 months a year, and it has a decent-sized home range, but it's workable. And so there have been people uh, 
going out with field crews in the spring looking at the nesting success and uh, reproductive health of the organism, of the uh, future sparrows. Uh, this is a picture of one of them. They, some people have a sense of where the nests are, and other people don't, just like they do for ants. It's an amazing how different we are in our skill sets. But at any rate, uh, they went out, and in 2012 now, which is two years later, uh, these are significant differences with the red. Uh, the fledglings are less. Everything else seems to be about the same, but the fledglings uh, are less in the oil sites compared to the oil sites. And that goes for, and in 2013 as well. So there's this, that's four years later, one of our resident little birds. And you probably only hear it chirp every once in a while when you're out there. And we can't look at everything, but we can look at this one. So there's, there's effects that have carried on. So we have ants that maybe have a six month delay and maybe even a little bit of help in the first six months, you might say. That, and we have uh, birds that four years later haven't recovered. <coughs> we also have loons out there, which are in the water body course. And the loons are migratory. Uh, they're here for only about three or four months a year. And these are some pHs in the, um, the blood tissues and uh, the plasma, the blood. And it looks like from 11 and 12, it went from, remember, one, two years later, all of a sudden we started seeing more pHs showing up. Uh, they're going to be fish eaters. So there's some kind of a lag effect going on. And so there's a higher incidence of loons with total pHs and a higher amount. And these are levels which, uh, in terms of individual organism uh, examinations, these levels are detrimental to the life of the, the loon. So three or four years later, there are still the effects. We don't want to go ahead of the data on this. We've collected more data, but we just, I can't show you more than that. Uh, <clears throat> for oysters, we couldn't find anything. We had uh, plates put out to look at colonization, and they looked at reefs for the, fir for the first few years, and we kind of expected that they would shut down. We didn't find any effects for the first two years, but in the last several years, in the lab, lab studies, and there has, been, there has been an effect. We don't know if in terms of the commercial fisheries it's been uh, significant, but in terms of the individual organism, they are significant years later. So there is this delayed effect coming off of this. Um, and the way the funding mechanism works, uh, they only figured this out at the end of a three-year funding cycle and weren't funded for year four and five. If they found it in year two, they would have been funded for years four, five, and six. <laughs> and so we're trying to follow this up. Um, the, the science community is. For fish, it's uh, interesting that we can find uh, there's a little mummy chuck in there. People get them for bait fish. You can find, in, we find pHs in the fish. And we know that they have a response to that pH and it's not healthy, it's toxicological. That's at the individual level. We can't find a community level response. That is the whole population of fish. We can find what happened to that individual fish. We know it's effective to that fish if it's exposed. We don't see an effect on several types of fish as a population of fish, a harvest of fish, or whatever. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist, it's just that we, we can't find it. And that's true across the literature. And this, we can find individual examples, but can't find population examples. <coughs> and again, that's a, a, a no, no result. It doesn't mean there isn't a result, it just means there is no result for what we've looked at. We may be looking at the wrong thing on this. So there is a lot of complexity to this. Um, there is a, a many mouths for one piece of dead ant organism, and it's a very tangled bank, as uh, Darwin used to say, many, many feeding cycles. So uh, what we expected before, we, we would have marsh fish uh, affected, and we did find some effects, but not at the, or, at the, at the organism level, but not at the population level, at least not yet. And that'll give rise to an analysis of food webs, which we're starting to do more uh, explicitly uh, with this funding cycle. It's a complicated food web. It's not a simple uh, catch them and kill them, or uh, oil them and they die. It's a much, there are a lot more linkages. We have these delays for the ants, we have for the birds, the oysters, and perhaps other organisms as well that we've already identified. So just to give you an idea of them, uh, 
this is an example I like to put up for baseline shifts. We've had a, a big baseline shift that happens slowly in our perception from year to year. And this is the fish, trophy fish, caught from 1957 to 2007. And as, as obvious from the graphs, you know, what used to be a trophy fish in 1957 and 1980s, they're much larger in 57 than they are in the 80s, and now, of course, in 2007. They're even smaller yet. This is the same dock, the same picture, the same uh, regatta, and much smaller fish. And it happened kind of incrementally, slowly, you know, 1%, 2% a year, a decrease in size from one to the next. And so that's, that's like a lot of habits, uh, it's something we need to pay attention to in terms of an oil spill, which has this dramatic effect in one year, and we also have these incremental cumulus effects from all other factors, including the oil, <coughs> as proper sand. So, in terms of a summary, the, uh, we had this dramatic effect from the oil, we have multiple re-oilings, we had multiple stressors already, and we have these chronic effects underneath. And so we need, uh, there was an awful lot of attention to this dramatic event, and I'm glad that there was. But we also have a lot of cumulative effects that are happening underneath this for this shifting baseline that's ha as uh, Jeremy would say, Jackson would say, and others. Uh, that happens underneath, we don't, we don't see it happening because it's such a small amount every year. <coughs> so uh, we knew a lot before, it was our expectation that we thought maybe we just missed a few pieces. And what we found out is that, well, we, we, it's the other way around, it's pulling the pocket inside out. We actually knew a, a very little and we need to know a lot. And it's a lot less that we know than we need to know for managing properly. And we have to make decisions, but we still could use uh, a long-term baseline, which is one of the chronic things that we have all found. Almost every one of us would say if we had a target outcome from this oil spill is that we would have baseline measurements continuously. And if you realize that the baseline is shifting from other factors all the time, you need to measure things all the time. It's just not every for once in a while, and six stations, year after year, uh, to keep going with it. <coughs> and, <coughs> as I that's pretty much what I just said. So, uh, in terms of resiliency of this marsh, uh, it is a uh, working coast, is the phrase, which kind of sounds like an excuse to damage it, to me. Uh, but as, are we looking at the resiliency of the coast in terms of an environment that works forces that society is developing on, or is it the other way around? Is it an environment to be used temporarily by some society and used for an economy underneath? So I'll, I'll, I think that's 30 minutes, right? 25 minutes and 10 All right. seconds. So we have some questions after that, but that's, that's basically what I had to say. Thank you. And there's, we don't want to, go too far into the other talks, but there are people from, each, from the consortium that are scattered about in the audience that could answer questions better than I could, probably, or comments. Yep? Did you look at some epiphytes, epiphytes in the marsh such as paragraphs snails, or concentration? Uh, if we looked at epiphytes on the marsh, so there are epiphytes on the plant and there are epiphytes in the plant. <laughs> So, and we, we have some people doing wipes of the plant, but that's really just starting. Our group is not doing that. Oh, well, um, they might. No, I don't think they're doing it right now. We're doing photosynthesis of the plant, it's at, uh, you know, 13 places every, twice a year. And uh, as Brian will talk about. Yeah, not, not the first year. Right. Can you all hear the responses? Is that okay? We'll touch on a little bit. Thank you.
thank you, Jean, for that talk. Um, next up, we have Dr. Brian Roberts uh, from LumCon and also CWC. Is that okay? I'm a little bit embarrassed. Yes. Okay, no, coffee would be great. Yeah, so if we want to get up and then afterwards, we'll come back. And I was just so excited for your talk. So. <laughs> All right, so we've got 10 minutes, so please get up, get some refreshments over there. Um, again, the restrooms are just around the corner, and I'll see you all back here in 10 minutes. So for our next guest speaker, if you all um, remember from just before the coffee break, <laughs> is Dr. Brian Roberts from LumCon and also the Coastal Waters Consortium. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Twilley and Turner for introducing this talk. Some of uh, what they said will make it easier to follow along with what I want to talk about. Um, I'm going to be talking today about some of the work we've been doing, uh, looking at the impacts or the basically understanding the salt marsh biogeochemistry and microbial community dynamics following the oil spill. Um, I'm the one giving this talk, but it is uh, the result of the effort of a lot of people within our Coastal Waters Consortium, as uh, Dr. Turner mentioned, we had 26 PIs the first go around. Uh, three of us were formed a biogeochemistry and microbial ecology subgroup, uh, Ann Bernhard and Ann Giblin from the Northeast. As a result, a lot of the personnel was based in Louisiana out of my lab. Um, we had a postdoc, John Martin, our first go around, who was involved in a lot of the work we presented. And we have uh, two new postdocs moving forward. But there have been a lot of people involved in this project. These are just the ones that have come through my lab. Um, a series of RAs, uh, graduate students, and undergrads, uh, some of which have been funded as RU interns through Coastal Waters Consortium and some through um, NSF RU site program that I've been the director of. Um, so this is the effort of a lot of people. So um, as been alluded to in the earlier talks, these ecosystems are pretty complex. And if you're trying to understand the impacts of oil, which has got toxicity and physical impacts associated with it, there are a number of direct impacts of oil as well as indirect impacts uh, that are mediated by the intermediary uh, components of the food web that are impacted by oil. And this is what happens when you uh, put a biogeochemist in charge of putting together a schematic diagram. It's sort of in the middle. Everything kind of flows through it. Um, <coughs> And so this is sort of the part that we're going to be talking about today. Our group is largely focused um, on this soil uh, component here of the biogeochemistry and microbes, as well as interaction with plants. But if you want to understand the, the impacts of oil, you have to understand a lot more about the way these systems function. They're a lot more complex than that. There are a number of indirect influences on the oil effects. There are physical forcing, the hydrology and sediment delivery, if you do not have good baseline data, it's sometimes difficult to determine whether or not the difference you see between sites that received oil and didn't receive oil is due to the oil itself or something about the hydrology of that system 
that not only delivered the oil, but may deliver different sediment properties to that. So this is an important um, concept to keep in mind when you're trying to interpret your results. We also have a number of other stressors on these systems. We have climate change going on. We're seeing changes within their salinity regimes from both uh, saltwater intrusion, as well as management practices of trying to uh, mitigate our land loss by um, introducing uh, freshwater diversions. We have changes in inundation patterns that occur as a result of climate change, as well as this interannual variability. And we see changes in vegetation. Some of these are related to these changes in salinity and inundation. Some of these are climate-induced changes that are um, associated with the expansion of black mangrove into these uh, wetlands that were previously dominated by Spartano and Terraflora. So you have to keep all these things in mind when you're trying to interpret what is happening at some component of your food web. Oh, and then on top of all that, we have an awful lot of pollution of nutrients that are coming down through the Mississippi River uh, drainage system. So our group's overall objectives were twofold. First was to try to improve our understanding of temporal and spatial patterns and marsh biogeochemical process rates, the associated microbial communities responsible for carrying out those processes, and the factors that regulate these rates. It's important that we have a solid baseline, despite the fact that our wetlands have been a really important part of the coastal environment um, in Louisiana for a very long time. We've done a lot of study. When we came to try to understand the baseline level, some of the processes we're we'll talking about, we found we didn't have really good baseline data, particularly at the locations where we were trying to study. Once you understand something about the way these systems function, then you can start to evaluate the impact that oil exposure has on these processes in the microbial communities. So our group has largely focused our activities um, in the first three-year funding cycle of Coastal Waters Consortium in these following areas, uh, focusing on the carbon cycle, uh, particularly looking at soil respiration and greenhouse gas flux, which also involves some other uh, elemental cycles, plant production and decomposition dynamics. There's been a large emphasis on the nitrogen cycle, looking at nitrification, denitrification, dissimilatory nitrate reduction to ammonium and anamox rates. Phosphorus cycle, looking at what phosphorus availability is like um, through looking at phosphorus absorption rates, looking at the iron cycle, looking at iron reduction rates, and then looking at the relationships between these process rates, the communities, and the abiotic variables in oil and oil marshes. Now today I'm going to focus on uh, talking about a few of these different components and some of the research we've done related to those. Um, these are largely um, trying to keep with the mandate, mandate of talking about our published results, or at least in most cases, uh, results that we have uh, for manuscripts that are currently in review. There's a couple of points, though, that I couldn't resist showing you a little bit about. Hopefully that convinced you with the first uh, set of publications about them. Okay. So, just to talk about our rationale. Biogeochemical pathways are carried out by a number of different groups. It's important to sort of understand some of those fundamental differences. So you can think about it this way. We have sort of two main classes. We've got autotrophs, or self-nourishers, and heterotrophs, which are nourish from others. The, tip, the classic way we think about autotrophs, we think about photoautotrophs, your plants. They get their energy from the sun and light. Well, there's another class called chemoautotrophs that get energy from reduced inorganic compounds. And then your heterotrophs, which get carbon energy from reduced organic compounds. So that includes all of us. At least, I don't know of any of you that may be phototaxic or anything, but I'm assuming most of you are heterotrophs. Okay. So when it comes to trying to anticipate, you know, hypothesize about how we think an oil spill might impact these systems, our overall viewpoint was, before this study started, that chemoautotrophic pathways are often going to be more susceptible to pollutants than heterotrophic pathways, because they tend to be carried out by a more limited number of organisms under a relatively narrow set of environmental conditions. So an example here for the nitrogen cycle in soils, um, the lines that are indicated in red are ones that are carried out by uh, chemoautotrophic 
uh, chemoautotrophs and chemo, their chemoautotrophic pathways. Those include nitrification and the process of anemones, which uh, takes ammonium and nitrate and produces N2 gas. In contrast, two uh, important heterotrophic pathways are denitrification, the conversion of nitrate to um, N2 gas, and dissimilatory nitrate reduction to ammonia, which is converting nitrate to ammonia. So as a result of this rationale, we hypothesized that ammonium oxidation, which is uh, nitrification, methane oxidation, and anamox, if it was present, would be the most impacted in oiled sediments. And denitrification, dissimilatory nitrate reduction to ammonium, and methane production would be much less impacted. And that largely abiotic processes, like phosphorsorption, which has to do with how um, sticky the components of the soil are for um, phosphorus, to use a real scientific term of sticky, um, will be the least impacted. Okay, so throughout the first part of uh, the CWC, we basically were looking at three regions that, that Dr. Turner alluded to. We have some sites in Terrebonne Bay, in the western part of uh, Barataria Bay near Grand Isle, and the eastern part of um, Barataria Bay uh, near Port Sulphur in the Bay Jimmy region. In each of those regions, we had paired oiled and unoiled sites that were determined based on some of the oil, oil analysis that Dr. Turner uh, talked about. We were very concerned about the high erosion rates that we see in our soils. So instead of just going into the marsh and setting up random quadrats, we decided we wanted to sort of incorporate that and try to ensure that we had some plots that would be present in these marshes for a long period of time. So we set up looking at, uh, for a lot of our studies, a gradient from the marsh edge from 5 to 20 meters into the marsh. This resulted in on the order of 50 total plots um, across the, the region. We have had some shifting of sites over time and then we've added some reference sites near Lump Pond and some sites along a salinity gradient over here in Barataria Bay. Our general sampling approach has been to try to take um, different approaches for asking different types of questions. We've um, utilized some high temporal resolution sampling. Lumcon is a really long way away from a lot of things, but it's really close to the marsh. Uh, that means that we can take advantage of the fact that these Terrebonne Bay sites are very close to Lumcon. Um, and so we sampled them monthly through the growing season in 2012, bi-monthly in 2013, and then seasonally since that for biogeochemical process rates, microbial communities, soil and water characterization. We've also tried to take advantage of um, whether it's directly in conjunction with it or um, very close in time, the sampling that Dr. Turner alluded to across the whole region. Um, where they do it in sort of late spring and in fall, and then we've also tried to sample in July. So we've gone across the whole region um, on the order of three times a year, um, and we've sampled a subset of biogeochemical rates um, across those and the microbial communities. And then we've done, uh, set up a series of intensive samplings at a subset of those above sites and or controlled sites for some intensive field sampling or experiments. So we've done greenhouse gas responses to changing salinities, look at explicitly at the expansion of Abyssinia into Spartina marshes to see how that may change some of the biogeochemistry, um, done some oil exposure, um, and then the big one moving forward is that one of the challenges of not having a baseline is not being able to sample these prior to the oil spill, so we're um, going to be building some marsh mesocosms at Lumcon. Um, that will hopefully be going into operation uh, around the turn of the year. To show you what I mean by some of our sampling, this is uh, our original uh, Terrebonne Bay sites where we have these two pairs of oiled and unoiled sites. Um, and then the, the pairs are separated by a larger distance than there is between the two, the two um, sites uh, that make up a pair. And then this is a sample from one of our oiled sites, uh, an example of our gradient into the marsh. This gradient is really important for us because we have some sites, for example, this site up here, in which since we established our sites in um, May of 2012, have lost on the order of 10 meters of marsh. So we still have these two plots that we had at the beginning, but we don't have the other ones. So I 
told you I'm going to talk about a few different processes. Uh, one of those is a, actually a suite of processes that are associated with soil greenhouse gas fluxes. We sampled those monthly in 2012, bi-monthly in 2013, um, and 2014 on we've been doing seasonally. Uh, we're using the Ventic static chamber method, um, except for when we have very high water levels and we use the floating chamber method. And we calculate uh, rates from changes in concentration from five time points during incubation. Okay, so there's a lot on this graph. We have carbon dioxide fluxes on the top, methane fluxes in the middle, nitrous oxide fluxes on the bottom. The cheat sheet version is over here on the left. This is over the entire year. The box and whisker plots for uh, the unoiled sites on the left and the oiled sites on the right. And then um, the right-hand panel is what those patterns look like over time, with the open bars again being the unoiled marshes and the gray being the oiled marshes. So our gas fluxes varied uh, significantly with oil status. Oiled sites were lower in CO2, higher in methane, and lower in nitrous oxide, net fluxes from the soil to the atmosphere. We do see some variation um, over time within the season. Um, in 2012, we had peak in uh, CO2 and nitrous oxide that occurred early in the summer with lower rates as we move towards the fall. We see no seasonal pattern in methane. So why do we see uh, higher net methane fluxes from the soils in the oiled marshes? Is that due to an increase in methane production or, as we hypothesized, a reduction in methane oxidation. The data that we have um, right now suggests that it may be due to uh, changes in methane oxides in bacteria communities. Their abundances tend to be higher in our unoiled sites than our oiled sites. This is seen throughout that 2012 year um, in our Terrebonne uh, marshes. It's also been seen across uh, the entire region. Um, this is in July of 2012, which is consistent with the hypothesis that uh, one of the responses to oil would be a suppression of methane oxidation. What else might be responsible for controlling greenhouse gas fluxes? We look at the soil properties um, for net CO2 flux. We see that um, uh, we have positive correlations with uh, organic carbon, total nitrogen, and soil water content. But when we break it down and look at the unoiled, which are the open symbols, we see that that's where we have the strong relationship. We do not have a significant relationship at all for the oiled sites. Nitrous oxide, we do have significant relationship. They do not explain a lot of the variance for some of them, with the exception of total nitrogen. But interestingly, we do not see a difference between the unoiled and the oiled sites. Um, for example, total nitrogen explains about 20 to 25% of the variance in net N2O flux in both the oiled and unoiled sites. So CO2 are positively related to soil organic carbon, nitrogen, and water, but this is only in the unoiled marshes. N2O fluxes are related to soil nitrogen, as well to, to some extent to the carbon and the C to N ratio. Uh, but it's similar between oil and unoiled marshes, and methane fluxes are not significantly related to any of the soil properties. Water depth um, is an important influence on net greenhouse gas fluxes. Now, this is something that's not often looked at in our uh, classic wetlands that show up in textbooks that are from the Atlantic coast that have a low marsh and a high marsh, because it's very easy to go out there um, during low tide and sample the marsh. Um, when you're at uh, sites that are of a tidal amplitude of 20 to 30 centimeters and your water level is driven by uh, wind more often than it is by tide, you get to the marsh when you can get to the marsh. And as a result, we actually did a lot more sampling that span a large gradient of water inundation. And what you see here um, is that CO2 and methane fluxes were significantly higher when water depths were less than 10 centimeters for both unoiled and oiled sites. Um, and N2O is significantly uh, greater uh, at lower depths when you combine both the oiled and unoiled plots. When your N went up, we could see a difference. So this is me going with something we do not have uh, quite in review because I'm waiting to see the rest of the story. 
but how long do these oil impacts persist? So this is what I showed you here in 2012, this is 2013 and 2014. You see we still see significant differences between our unoiled and oiled sites in both of those years. So four and a half years and counting, we've been sampling in 2015, don't really have that data processed yet to be able to tell you about it, but we are seeing consistent response um, in terms of the soil greenhouse gas flux is two to four years post oil spill. One of the things to think about when you're talking about greenhouse gas fluxes is the fact that they don't all have the same warming potential. We tend to think about carbon dioxide releases the atmosphere and how that correlates with climate change and warming because that's the most abundant in the greenhouse gases. But in fact, methane has about 25 times the met, uh, warming potential of CO2, and nitrous oxide is 298 times. So you don't have to have a very big flux of N2O to have a very uh, significant impact that may be on par with what you see in some of the other gases. So if you convert all of these fluxes into carbon units, you can talk about sort of the radiative forcing due to the soil processes. And what you see here in 2012 um, is the, uh, the, these CO2 equivalent fluxes broken down into CO2 in the gray bars, methane in the black, and N2O in the white. This is for each of the months of the year, and this is overall in the year. You see CO2 dominates the contribution to radiative forcing in Terrebonne Bay uh, at a little over 80%. But when you break it down by oil and unoiled sites, you see that the, on the oiled sites, the methane accounts for about 33% of that total uh, radiative forcing, and only 4% in the unoiled sites. So we're seeing a huge shift in terms of the relative importance of methane as these sites become oil. When you look at 2013 and 2014, you see that in, um, throughout the three years that methane accounts for 33 to over half of the radiative forcing from the oil marshes, and only three to five percent from the unoil marshes. So methane is becoming increasingly important uh, greenhouse gas flux um, as these sites have been oiled. Okay, so now I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about the nitrogen cycle and talk about nitrification in general. <coughs> First, so one of the first things that really struck us was how high our nitrification rates were. Um, Louisiana salt marshes have the highest rates of nitrification potential um, in the literature. These are our 2012 rates that are in the Martin et al. 2015 paper and our 2013 uh, rates that are um, in a manuscript we're working on. Uh, compared to other salt marsh sediments, which are carried out using the exact same techniques by my uh, co-PIs, and Bernhard and Ann Giblin. So it's not that there's a bias in the way these are being done, they're being done by the same people, um, and in other estuarine sediments. However, despite what we hypothesized, when we went across the region in 2012, we did not see a significant difference in nitrification potential in between our unoiled sites and open symbols and uh, oiled plots in uh, the black bars on any of the three regions. And we didn't see uh, a big difference in the uh, bacterial or the archaeal uh, ammonium oxidizer abundances um, in these regions. Although the way it is depicted here, you do have a trend towards the unoiled being higher in abundance than the oil. So in 2012, we saw this seasonal pattern here. We had a peak uh, in these rates in July. In 2013, we actually saw much, much higher rates earlier in the season, and July was actually not statistically different in the two years. Um, so we have a different seasonal pattern. But more interestingly to me is that now three years uh, post-spill, um, we actually are seeing a consistent pattern in Terrebonne Bay of higher rates in the unoiled marshes than in the uh, oiled marshes. Uh, and early in the season when these rates are highest is when they're actually significantly, statistically significant differences. So there's something fundamentally different about 2012 and 2013. What is controlling these rates of nitrification? Having these really high rates, what's driving that? So if you look seasonally within Terrebonne Bay, we see organic carbon explains the highest percent of the variation 
but it's only about 18%. But in the months that have the highest rates in June and July, they explain 35 to 40%. There are some other significant relationships with some other um, uh, soil properties in these sites. We went across the region, we had a very similar pattern that organic carbon explains the majority of the variation. But interestingly, we saw a different pattern within each of the three regions. Um, and all of them explain a lot more than they do overall, between 35 and 50 percent of the variance. But we do not see a significant relationship um, with oil uh, in the oiled sites with organic carbon, only in the unoiled sites. What about the microbial communities? If you look at the um, what I've shown here is ammonium oxidizing bacteria, the ammonium oxidizing archaea show a very similar pattern. Uh, nitrification does tend to increase with these abundances, but it only explains about 20% of the variance. Um, and actually, it only explains it significantly within uh, two of our three regions. <coughs> and we, but also surprisingly, is that we actually see a stronger relationship with those abundances in the oiled sites than we do in the unoiled sites. And this is much less of the variation being explained by these abundances than um, Bernhard and Giblin had seen in the northeastern salt marshes. So we did some uh, multivariate statistics to try to see if we could tease apart what's, how these sites um, separate. And what we find is that we see stronger separation between sites um, than we do between oil status. So in the top panel here, we have uh, Western Barataria in gray, uh, Terrebonne in white, and then Eastern Barataria in black. Um, and so we see a pretty strong um, distinction here. Western Barataria marshes are different than the other two regions. Um, and for the most part, Eastern Barataria are intermediate, but there is some overlap with Terrebonne sites. Uh, but we do not see a separation with oil status. And this first axis here has positive loadings with uh, organic matter. So organic matter, organic carbon, and total nitrogen. And the y-axis, or axis 2, is uh, related to increasing relative elevation and has positive loadings of nitrification potential, and then AOA and AOB abundances. So I want to go back to something that's, that was very interesting to us, is that if you try to look at the correlations between the abundances of the microbes and the, uh, the nitrification rates, what you see here are the, um, the R values for ammonium oxidizing bacteria and archaea within each of the three regions, Terrebonne, Western Barataria, Eastern Barataria, and then overall. To draw your attention to these boxes around the oil, and we see that we have significant correlations um, only with oil sites. None of these are with the unoiled. Um, but in Terrebonne, it's only with the ammonium oxidizing bacteria. Western Barataria, it's with ammonium oxidizing bacteria and archaea. And Eastern Barataria, it's only with archaea. So we only have a relationship between what is thought to be the organism responsible for carrying out nitrification and nitrification process itself um, in our oiled sites. But if you look at methane oxidizing bacteria, which are very um, similar in their structure to uh, ammonium oxidizers and can actually carry out the process of nitrification, we actually see that in two of our three regions and overall, that methane oxidizing bacteria have positive correlations uh, and quite strong ones with uh, nitrification or unoiled sites. So you sort of have a double whammy here of the two types of studies I've talked about. Is that in unoiled sites, uh, methane oxidizers are playing a big role in oxidizing methane, as you would, their name indicates they should, but also at regulating nitrification rates. But as oil comes in, they are getting suppressed, and they are no longer oxidizing methane, so we have higher rates of methane flux, and we also see that they are not what is driving um, the nitrification rates. They're actually being driven more by um, the traditional ammonium oxidizing bacteria, archaea. We look within those nitrifying communities, 
and this is work that's uh, led by Ann Bernhard. Uh, I'm not going to claim to fully understand every component of this. Uh, what I'm going to basically tell you is that um, you can actually identify individual components of that community. And so what these bars here are indicating, the different colors represent different uh, clusters within the nitrifying community, and this is for ammonium oxides and archaea and bacteria. And what you see here is that while, for example, in, in bacteria, you may see some differences between the bars for terrebone, western barataria, and eastern barataria, uh, within those regions, comparing oiled and unoiled, you do not see strong differences in at least who's present. But we do see some differences and shifts in terms of which um, of these different nitrifiers are responsible and have positive correlations with nitrification rates. Where in Terrebonne, we actually have several of these different um, groupings that have positive correlations in the unoiled sites. Whereas in um, Western Barataria, we have some that actually have uh, relationships with the uh, oiled sites. In, only, and then in Eastern Barataria, we have some that have relationship with both. So we're seeing a shift in who is in these communities and who is responsible for carrying out these processes. So it may not be the um, predicted response of big changes in nitri and nitrification rates between oil and unoiled status in 2012, but we are seeing more subtle changes in the communities that influence the relationships that those organisms have with carrying out these important processes. All right, so the last uh, set of uh, data I want to talk about is phosphor absorption. We have highly variable rates of phosphor absorption within our uh, region, comparable to most of the range that's seen uh, throughout most coastal uh, wetland environments. But we do not see any differences between region or between oiled and unoiled sites. Part of that is because while we have about an order of magnitude range across our whole data set, within each region we see about a five-fold difference. So the range we see between within a region and even within a site is often as big or nearly as big as we see across the entire data set. We do have very good predictive capabilities for what uh, is driving phosphor absorption. If you look across all marshes, 70% of the variance in phosphor absorption is explained by iron. Um, and actually within each of the regions, it's uh, about 90%. And if you actually exclude one outlier here, this also is about 90%. But they're all individually um, greater than 50%. So one thing that phosphor absorption allows you to do is to assess what people use in uh, northern forests try and talk about nitrogen saturation, we can do a similar thing looking at phosphorus saturation. And so what you're doing here is coming up with a theoretical estimate of how saturated your, your soils are for phosphorus. And so values that are above 0.15 would be saturated. You see that um, we only have a couple of sites um, or plots within Terrebonne that sort of exceed this eutrophication tipping point. We can also calculate a metric called soil phosphorus storage capacity, which says how much more phosphorus could be stored in the soil. And so um, we see here that these terrebone sites that are closer to saturation um, have less capacity to store future uh, soil, at least uh, uh, future phosphorus uh, loads, at least for uh, some of the sites. Uh, but in general, we don't see a very big difference across our region. But when you look across the whole data set, as phosphorus um, sorption sites become less available, which is indicated by increase in saturation ratio, phosphorus sorption index decreases exponentially, and as soil uh, storage capacity of the phosphorus increased, PSI also increased. So I mentioned that we have a lot of variability um, across or even within our sites in a lot of these biogeochemical processes. And this may be a little counterintuitive to people because when you go out and you look at our marshes, they don't look like they see in a textbook where you have a low marsh and you see this huge gradient in elevation. If you look out, our marshes look really flat. But what we've noticed is that we see some interesting patterns with marsh position. So this is greenhouse gas flux, this is the net CO2 flux. Again, the open symbols are unoiled and the gray are oiled. 
Um, and this is increasing distance from the marsh edge. Uh, so we see stronger patterns, both show an increase as you move into the marsh. Uh, and in the R squared and the unoiled uh, is about 0.7, and it's highly significant. When you look at methane, your eye is drawn to this apparent decrease in um, the oiled sites, but in fact, this small, subtle increase in the unoiled sites is highly significant, has an R squared of 0.95, um, and this is only sort of marginally significant of a decrease. And N2O didn't show a spatial pattern with distance for oiled un or unoiled marshes. We look in 2013 and 14, CO2 shows a stronger increase with distance in the unoiled sites than in the oiled sites, as we saw here in 2012. Um, methane trends for declines in oiled and increases in unoiled marshes, N2O. Um, unoiled marshes tended to increase with distance and oil marshes significantly decreased in 2013, but showed no pattern in 14. So again, N2O is not as clear of a pattern. This is greenhouse gases. We look at the nitrogen cycle. So now, not only do we have within each region, we have all three regions. Nitrification potential increases with distance in Terrebonne, decreases in Western Barataria, and shows no pattern in Eastern Barataria. We look at the ammonium oxides in Archaea and bacteria, we see the exact same pattern. Increase, decrease, no relationship. If we look at uh, total nitrate reduction and the near-rest gene, which is the indication for uh, denitrifiers, we see a similar pattern. Increase in Terrebonne, decrease in Western Barataria, and no pattern in Eastern Barataria. Look at the phosphorus sorption. We see increases in Terrebonne. While not significant, we see a trend towards a decrease in Western Barataria and no pattern in Eastern Barataria. So what's happened? So I mentioned these marshes look relatively flat, but these small scale changes in elevation have basically made us just look at those marsh elevation gradients in a micro scale. Because over the course of these five to 20 meters in Terrebonne marshes, we see that we have an increase in the order of uh, 10 centimeters. In Western Barataria, we actually decrease by about eight centimeters. In Eastern Barataria, we don't see a change. How does this translate to soil properties? Well, if you look at organic carbon across those three regions, we have an increase in Terrebonne, a decrease in Western Barataria, no pattern in Eastern Barataria. And just to save us from all looking at hundreds of graphs, just looking at Terrebonne here, and looking at the pattern increasing distance, we see organic, uh, the water content, total nitrogen, total phosphorus, iron, aluminum, and plant available phosphate all increase with distance from the marsh edge. So, I thought I had a summary bullet here. Um, so we have these patterns that, um, within our marsh, that seem to be uh, dictated by change. Difference is in elevation that change the inundation patterns and have uh, corresponding changes in the soil properties that are driving a lot of our biogeochemistry, which we didn't realize before we started the study, which is something you need to consider when you're trying to figure out how to manage moving forward. So oil sites are lower in CO2 and N2O and higher in methane fluxes. We've seen this for about four years so far. Um, our small scale measurements, we're not detecting the same level of response signal as we see in these whole system measures. Nitrification rates do not show consistent responses to oil. We saw no effects in 2012, but some differences in 2003 in at least Terrebonne. Um, the ammonium oxides in Archaea and bacteria abundances do not show consistent oil responses. And no overall community differences in ammonium oxidized, but there are differences in the correlations of the individual population with rates between oil and oil sites. And phosphorus sorption did not show a strong response to oil. But one of the real striking responses is that the process rates display high spatial variability within our marshes, and it's related to variability in soil properties, which appear to be, at least in part, regulated by differences in elevation and hydrology. And I want to end by just putting things in context that, you know, it's difficult to detect impacts and recovery from oiling due to a variety of differences that we see in the timing, spatial distribution, extent of oiling, the overall and specific compound degradation rates, the loss of habitat as a result of oiling, decreasing amounts of residual oil across the coast as you move further and further away from the spill, and the re-oiling events that Dr. Turner mentioned earlier, like Hurricane Isaac, have added to the complexity. This is an area here 
that was sampled uh, about two weeks after Isaac that did not look like this prior to Isaac. And the oil uh, samples indicate that there was a stimulation in oil, um, and it was of a Macondo signature. And these marshes are very complex. Uh, there's a lot of different drivers that are, that are being forced upon these systems and the way that they function. I think it's really important that when we make management decisions, we need to remember that these coastal ecosystems are faced with multiple stressors that not only are likely to influence the functioning of the systems, but also how they'll respond to future spills. Because as Dr. Twilley alluded to, trying to apply uh, something that happens in one region to another region may be complicated. Even within your own region, if you're experiencing changes in your salinity regime, the degree to which you're inundated, how your vegetation changes, those things may all influence the way that your system functions and make it a little bit more difficult to detect the, or predict what the response to a future spill may be. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. So I've got 30 minutes to answer that question. <laughs> um, well, I mean, that's a very good question. I think one of the things that you're, you're trying to evaluate when you, we can never do fully restore these systems. We, you know, we're fighting a challenging battle as we continue to lose land uh, regardless of when oil spills happen. But if we understand more about the way that these systems function and how the roles that they play, you know, the, the wetlands serve an important location on the landscape where um, they're between the delivery of nutrients coming from the river that's draining the entire watershed and, and exporting it offshore. So changes in the ability of that system to retain and even more importantly perhaps remove nitrogen from that system before it goes offshore and impacts epoxia is very important. So if you have a change in your system that influences the rate at which denitrification takes place, that's important to know because that's and that's not retained in the marsh, it's actually removed from the system or at least the atmosphere. Um, understanding what happens with uh, interested in how the relative rate of sea level rise in our region one of the things that drives that is greenhouse gas fluxes. So if you have a change in your system that changes the relative portion contribution of methane to um, the atmosphere, that has long-term feedbacks that influence the rate of sea level rise. Because as you increase methane flux, you increase temperatures and decrease uh, snow, sea ice, and increase water levels. So there are a lot of feedbacks here, but I think if we want to understand what components are the most important for us to be able to manage or make those decisions, we need to understand better the role that these systems really play. And so understanding how these things are connected, I think, is really important. Would you like to tie these to the carbon credits for marsh restoration? These are results? Um, not until you incorporate the plants into the equation, which what we're doing. I, I, I think we, we've got to, and that's always, it's always, it's always, it's always a, there, there are claims, you know, there are assertions about carbon flux right. credits. Right. And that's dependent upon CO2 flux and methane flux. Right. And so if you take one sample site versus another site, you get very different results. Yes. Right, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I guess I was misinterpreting how your con the context of what you're asking, but yes, these are things that need to be considered if you're going to be making decisions about carbon credits for trade-offs. Some sites are gonna have different valuations associated with them based upon what they mean for gas fluxes. So nobody asked the obvious question about why, why might there be differences in these 
You see these strong spatial patterns across these three regions. You know, why might there be differences? Why? Well, I have. Anybody got any? Who's got, who's got ideas? That could be, I, I think part of it is, is so, you know, if you look at the way most of our marshes originally form, you end up, you know, outside the channel, you tend to have these sort of naturally high levees. And if you actually look at sort of healthy marshes that have not had as much erosion, you tend to have that levee that kind of comes down and it kind of rises up again. I pointed out that our Terrebonne sites, we had a couple of sites that we already lost 10 meters in three years. Um, in many of those cases, what's happened is, that, and they also tend to be lower in absolute elevation, meaning they're inundated to on a greater frequency than some of our other sites. They don't sit as high in the water. So my conjecture is, is that essentially our erosion rates have been so high at those particular sites that we've sort of eroded away those levels. And so you're beyond it. Because it's not, the, the erosion rate's faster than the resupply that's coming from those channelizations. That's my conjecture. Don't quote me on it, but that's what one of the things that's there. There's clearly some big differences. And so this, you know, plays into, you know, these sites were selected primarily to go out there and see places that where there was oil and nearby where there wasn't. But you get some different pictures in the way that these systems work depending upon, you know, what sites were selected. And so you need to think about this complexity when we're trying to evaluate comparing one site to the next. Have you concluded anything different with the reaction of the marsh to the oil from the condo than previous oil spills? Say like the terrible marriage. There's been a lot documented. Well, there's been a lot documented, but none of the measurements that I showed you here, there are any of these. None of those measurements were. So I mean, yes, there are a lot of oil spills, and we do, we can, we've started to sort of look at um, some of those other spills that have happened, and sort of see changes that we see in shoreline and things like that associated with it. But in terms of the biogeochemical processes and that functioning component of that system, there there isn't data. I mean, I wish there was. Our job would be a lot easier if we actually had some baseline data on what these rates were. That's a very good suggestion. We, we do have a wealth of oil spills around here, and we need to take advantage of that when we're trying to evaluate what we need to do moving forward. Thank you when kicked off the stage, but I, I'll take another question. All right. Well, has there been a tracking of oil spills post Monado at these sample locations? As whether or not there's other oil spills influencing this data set? Well, that's what Dr. Turner was alluding to before. I mean, we, and actually, because we, we have a different sampling uh, regime than Dr. Turner does with, with his group, we have complementary oil samples that are collected. So, and frankly, I'm waiting on a lot of, of, of that data to sort of put some of these pieces together. But we can detect some of these things. For example, we were, this picture right here, I mean, that we know was Macondo that happened after Isaac. We can tease apart, uh, you know, differences of, you know, knowing whether or not, though, what I want to say, so yes, we are addressing it, but one thing that is challenging is that heterogeneity that Dr. Turner alluded to in the fact that if you go out to collect a sample that's 10 meters in, you know, one month, then you come back the next month and you sample it, you know, at 10 meters in, but you're a meter over, you may see some pretty drastic differences in those concentrations. So it may be low one month, the next month might be high. That doesn't mean that there actually has been a new oiling event. So we need to look at more specifically at those biomarkers to indicate you know, how degraded the age of that oil is. And, um, and we need to look at it over time. So you have a trend. You may have a low point and a high point, but overall you have some sort of trend or trajectory associated with it. So again, complexity is the, I guess, the answer. And now I know I'm off the stage. So, if you have questions, I'll be happy to take them later. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Roberts. We have Dr. Fernando Galvez up next talking about fish deep water horizon. Great, thank you for the invitation. Okay. So uh, I posed the question, how was the biology of a marsh fish affected by the deep water horizon oil spill? Uh, when I mean biology, I'm really going to be focusing on the physiology, the developmental biology, and a little bit on the uh, molecular uh, uh, biology as well. So I'm from uh, Louisiana State, and this is actually a collaborative effort, and I'll get to the, making the acknowledgement at the end. Now I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to be focusing on one fish, which is uh, here the uh, Funculus grandis, or the Gulf killifish. As Dr. Turner alluded to, this is also referred to as the cockerel minnow, or if you go a little east, the bull minnow or the mud minnow. It's a very popular bait fish uh, for those of you that uh, do fish. And my group has been using this quite extensively even prior to the uh, deep water rise in oil spill to essentially monitor environmental stress and essentially look at this as a model uh, understanding the mechanisms of environmental stress tolerance. Now, uh, for some reports, it's the most abundant vertebrate in coastal marshes. Certainly, it's uh, very abundant from uh, site to site. You'll find quite a few of them. Uh, we use them quite extensively uh, due to the fact that they're relatively easy to raise in captivity. So we can collect them in the field, bring them back to the lab, we can rear them multiple generations. Um, they are also relatively sensitive to chemical toxicity. Now at the end of this presentation, I'll talk a little about, uh, bit about the fact that this sensitivity will vary depending on the population from which these uh, 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 fish are uh, derived from. Uh, we take advantage of the fact that they have transparent embryos and so we can actually, as the animal is developing through embryogenesis, we can actually monitor inside the animal and look at how the organs are developing. And we'll see later on is that uh, early development is actually a very crit uh, critically sensitive time point uh, to oil exposure. Uh, compared to a lot of other fish species, there's a fair bit of characterization of its embryology. Uh, we know a lot about its biochemics, uh, biochemistry and its physiology. Uh, also relatively a fair bit about the ecology and the population genetics. Uh, we also have a growing uh, genomics toolkit. I'm not going to go into too much of the specifics of some of the more recent techniques like RNA-seq and bioinformatics. However, we, we do know a fair bit about these nitty-gritty little details, and so we can actually start to exploit some really uh, new age, uh, leading, uh, cutting edge uh, techniques uh, for using this fish. And so the presentation today is going to focus on uh, predominantly on two studies. Uh, this first study uh, by Whitehead et al. was published in 2012 in Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. And to our understanding, it was the first report of a biological impact seen in an aquatic vertebrate. In this second study, uh, my graduate student, the Dubansky, who's now a postdoc at University of North Texas, uh, was published in 2013, looking uh, at really an extension of this study. And so really, our, we're interested in, in three primary experimental questions. Uh, first off, what are the physiological molecular impacts of oil exposure? Predominantly looking at different sensitive stages of, of, of uh, sensitivity and trying to address what are some of the fitness level consequences of these oil exposures. And I'll touch on predominantly of this uh, towards the latter part of the presentation. Uh, we're not going to go into too much detail about this. Uh, uh, part, we've looked extensively at the geographical and temporal extent of oil in the field and try to understand the impacts of uh, uh, different oil events on, on uh, Gulf killifish populations. And more recently, we've been interested in understanding how does evolutionary history and exposure history affect the sensitivity of uh, uh, to deep water rise in oil. So we all know that uh, deep water rise in oil spill was a, a very uh, large event. Approximately 800 million liters of oil was released during, uh, over the course of about 87 days. Oil was spread over a very large area. And this, uh, uh, this was complicated uh, by the fact that a lot of chemical disbursements were also added, which in itself may help uh, mitigate some of the fact effects of oil coming in, but certainly increase the, the toxicity of that oil. Um, this is in comparison a much larger uh, oil spill than the Exxon Valdez, which there's been a lot of characterization of this spill uh, on fish populations, but certainly it's a very large event. Um, these numbers are a little different than uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Turner presented, but uh, needless to say that Louisiana was uh, highly impacted. Uh, over half of the, uh, the uh, 
uh, shoreline of Louisiana, about 790 kilometers of shoreline was oiled in, in Louisiana, and this is about 1,770 kilometers of shoreline uh, throughout the northern Gulf of Mexico. So it's, it's a very large event. Now this is actually taken from uh, one of the more heavily impacted sites that we studied. This is in, in Grand Terre, Louisiana, uh, southern edge of uh, Bear Terre Bay. Here you can see the uh, fish traps that we commonly use to collect our uh, Gulf killifish. And you can see here in, at the end of June 2010 that the traps really are on the edge of the oil and you can see the sheen on the surface. Now the first study was really um, you know, we, we started getting reports of an oil spill uh, late April, and then it was uh, certainly before my 40th birthday became apparent, well, this is a pretty big deal. So we started getting all our uh, field collection uh, equipment, and we first off started going east because all of the, uh, all of the uh, um, models suggested that oil was gonna actually impact predominantly Mississippi and Alabama. And so we did a lot of sampling, or we did some sampling in Alabama, at three sites, uh, Fort Morgan, Alabama, Upper Mobile Bay and uh, Bayou Lavatre. We also do, did sampling two sample sites in Mississippi, Bay St. Louis, just uh, east of here, and Bellefontaine Point, and our one site in uh, Grand Terre, Louisiana. Now, we're at, by the time we started sampling Grand Terre, this started becoming like Fort Knox, and so sampling actually became relatively difficult, but we managed to uh, get onto some of these sites. Now, we basically, in a nutshell, just to kind of summarize a, a lot of chemistry data and a lot of remote, remote sensing data, of all the, of these uh, different six different sites, uh, based on our sampling, Grand Terre was the only location that essentially was impacted significantly by oil. And we say that it was the only site that had significant elevation of oil in the sediments and in the water. Okay. It also had, uh, in comparison to these in which Oil came close, but uh, never reached within the time frame, at least until August 2010, were not impacted uh, by oil. Most of the, uh, the polyaromatic hydrocarbons were uh, sequestered within the sediment. We had extremely high levels of, of PAHs in the sediment. And in fact, uh, as I showed previously, this is what our uh, marsh edge looked at, looked like in Grand Terre, Louisiana, uh, heavily impacted. Here you can see the boom. And you can see here that these are Gulf killifish that they were in fact exposed. Now, the first study was um, not funded initially. And so we went out there and tried to do what we could uh, within the, the context of not having, uh, certainly the uncertainty of knowing how we were gonna pay for it. Uh, but finally we got uh, some funding to actually measure some of the things. But, uh, ultimately, we're interested in measuring tissue-specific responses to these fish collected within the field. Uh, we were, my group was predominantly looking at physiology and protein level expression changes in collaboration with Andrew Whitehead's group, uh, uh, looking at genome-wide mRNA transcript changes. So basically, just in a, a five-second biology uh, uh, course here, mRNA is basically the, uh, the blueprint from which proteins are made. So it's an intermediary step between the gene at the DNA level and the protein. And so we're gonna be looking uh, extensively at mRNA transcript levels, and I'll just very briefly go through that when I show them. Uh, we also have been doing a lot of work on early life exposures, uh, a lot to field collected waters and sediments. More recently, we've been doing a lot of work on uh, various different manipulations of oil and uh, uh, water spiked with oil and sediment spiked with oil. We've been looking at various uh, measures of development, time to hatch, hatching success, and gene expression, as well as physiology. Now, this is what a microarray looks like, and, and this is actually uh, starting to replace more recently with newer technologies like RNA-seq. But essentially, each one of these dots represents a specific or a unique mRNA transcript, okay? So this dot here may represent a mRNA transcript that produces a certain protein. Okay. And what we're able to do is, based on the level or the color that's indicated, have an indication of whether that mRNA has increased in abundance, remains constant, or has decreased in abundance. And so there's approximately 6,800 different transcripts. And so this is a genome-wide in as much as we're able to look at a good assort assortment of the different types of mRNA transcripts that would be in the tissue. 
And all of these spots are essentially, uh, would be fit within that little spot. So essentially use robotics to put these little specks of, uh, of uh, these uh, probes on there, and then we essentially hybridize them with actual mRNA collected from the tissue. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, the technique. And so what we're able to do is generate uh, various scans that look like this. And in fact, now to our understanding, this was the first application of this technology to, uh, an oil, uh, to oil contaminated fish in the field. And so let me just very quickly uh, orient you to this. Uh, here, each one of these, rep these blocks represents uh, our different populations going from west to east. So Grand Terre to Louisiana population is always on the, on the far left. Each one of these different columns, you'll see that for most there's three different columns. This would be May 2010 before oil hit. This would be the end of June after oiling. And this was in August 2010 when there started to be somewhat of a recovery. When certainly a lot of the visible oil on the surface was starting to dissipate. But certainly there was a lot of oil still in the sediment. And so each one of these columns represents the same timing from pre-oil to some time after oil and recovery. Now, yellow represents a very high upregulation in that abundance of that mRNA transcript, whereas blue magenta represents a large downregulation. Now, in a nutshell, what we find here is that the Grand Terre, coincident with the arrival of oil, which at this site, and I forgot to point out, Oil arrived at this site. Oil arrived at this site around June 10th to June 14th, okay, based on some of the satellite imagery that we had uh, obtained. Uh, this sample uh, sampling was done in around the end of June. So, in around two weeks after the initial oiling of this site, uh, those fish that we had collected, we had taken the livers, and what we found, as shown here by this high yellow, is a group of mRNA transcripts that were very highly upregulated and another group of transcripts that were very highly downregulated. Now, it looks like a big a mess here, but essentially this site here uh, is in the fish from those sites were the only ones to show this pattern, okay? Now, these groups of transcripts are what are called AHR ligand regulated, aerial hydrocarbon receptor ligand regulated uh, mRNAs. So uh, essentially, and I'll go on to talk about this, what these different transcripts represent, but essentially these uh, gene expression in the livers of the GT fish are, uh, the differential expression is coincident with the location and the time of the arrival of oil. Now, just in a, in a nutshell here, this uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, when they enter into a cell, they bind to this uh, AHR uh, receptor. When that happens, the, the chaperones come off and allows this, this uh, uh, the, uh, the ligand together with the, the receptor to go into the nucleus where they bind to uh, this other uh, fellow here at Arndt and they can bind to uh, xenobiotic response elements that are just upstream of many different genes. When this happens, whatever that, uh, that gene is, it will produce uh, increase the abundance of nuclear, nuclear mRNA. This nuclear mRNA is what we're basically seeing here, okay? So we see a whole bunch that are upregulated in response to this, or a whole bunch that are downregulated. We say that their AHR receptor ligand mediated because they all follow through, or all basically follow through this pathway. One of these is cytochrome P450 or CYP1A, which is involved in the metabolism of oil. So essentially, you've got this uh, hydro phobic substance, when it enters into the organism, uh, the cells try to make it more water soluble in order to metabolize it. Now, this is a good thing, you're trying to metabolize the oil. But there's a lot of indications that upregulation of this pathway, in fact, leads to some of the downstream cardiovascular and developmental effects that we often see in embryogenesis, during embryogenesis. So although this is a good thing in trying to metabolize the oil, it's also been shown that if you increase it too much, it actually has these developmental impacts that'll show momentarily. Now, we also see here that cytochrome P450, if you look at the gills, uh, from our gills from uh, fish collected in May 2010, versus those that came immediately after oiling, okay, and, sure, uh, and during the recovery period, the initial recovery period, we see uh, cytochrome P450 is shown by that dark staining pattern, 
it's increased in abundance. What we're looking at here is you know, here's the chemistry where we basically take an antibody against that protein and we're able then to look at not the mRNA, but rather the protein and to see if it's actually being upregulated. And so it's suggesting that these animals are in fact changing. Now, I, I want to clarify, this is not a mutation. I've had U.S. congressmen that try to uh, tell me that this was a mutation. I remember I had a Russian reporter come into my, my lab and says, I'm here to see mutations. And I just go, sorry, sorry to say I have no mutations to show you. These are actually protein level effects and, raw, and not, are not mutations. Okay? Now, in fact, we, we looked at as late as August 2011, we see that there's still, despite the fact that, that oil started to decrease in concentration in the field, we still see an, a very high level of, of uh, CYP1A expression in the gills. Okay. If you actually look at the gills, there is actually a lot of damage, there's a lot of hyperplasia, and there's a lot of mucus sites, it's a little hard to see on this image, but there is some physical damage, not a mutation, but rather physical damage to that, that gill epithelium. And I should say that the gill really is, um, it performs a lot of function, it actually it functions much like our lungs in, in, in uh, gas exchange, it acts like our kidneys in iron and acid base regulation, so it does a lot of different things. And so, uh, essentially, in a nutshell, we, we show that, uh, that these animals, in fact, uh, have been exposed to the toxic components of oil. Okay, so PAH is essentially getting into the animal. And though the oil in the hydrocarbons may not be accumulating in the tissues uh, to a great extent, they are getting into the animal and are existing, exerting a biological effect. Now, we also found a lot of gene transcripts that in the grand terror population decrease substantially in their abundance in the grand terror. You see here in these other populations where you see yellow, they're increasing. So these animals, as you're going from May through June into August, these animals are starting to reproduce. This is their reproductive cycle. And so that oil in the vent really coincides with the peak of, uh, of uh, reproduction for this species, which typically happens from around May through about September and October. Okay? There's a down regulation of a whole suite of different uh, genes uh, involved with reproduction, zona pellucidae and choreogenin, which are involved in the um, in the outer eggshell, if you may, the chorion of the of the of the uh, the, uh, the egg, uh, vitellogenin, um, and so these are downregulated in a grand hair fish. We also found uh, a very high upregulation, as shown by this high yellow comparison to the really the scattered the noise here seen in the other populations in, in various genes associated with proteolysis. What's interesting is a, a paper came out uh, around the same time showing that this AHR receptor, this here they call it the dioxin receptor because it actually binds dioxins as well. This is the equivalent of the AHR receptor, is a ligand-dependent ubiquitin ligase. So basically going through this uh, through this schematic here, um, PAHs can activate the AHR receptor, they can act as this ubiquitin ligase. It can increase the activity of uh, uh, ubiquitin ligase activity. And this activity can actually degrade sex steroid receptors. And so it's, it's a mechanism for actually degrading receptors. And so we propose that, uh, that this in itself could, uh, in fact, suppress sex hormone induced uh, gene expression in these animals. And we propose, although we didn't have at the point, endpoints to, to really confirm it, that there's indications that reproductive fitness could be compromised if you have pHs high enough uh, to essentially elicit the HR pathway, which in fact we in fact show to happen. So there is some uh, suggestion of comp uh, compromised uh, reproduction, uh, essentially altered uh, estrogen signal. Now, we've done a lot of work in cardiovascular fitness, and I'll, I'll spend a lot of uh, time from now on talking about this, but there's also a lot of gene transcripts uh, associated with cardiovascular, cardiovascular physiology that are also differentially uh, expressed in our grand terror population that were not seen in our other sites that did not receive oil. And so there's some indications of altered cardiac physiology. Now there's several studies that have come out, various consortium and actually independent studies. This is a study by Cardona's group, where I highlighted a few points here. We show that environmentally realistic exposures to PHS cause specific dose-dependent defects in cardiac function. 
In this case, they were looking at uh, uh, different species that I'm just showing you, the Lufantuna here, but essentially showing that cardiac function has been compromised and it culminates into pericardial edema, which is swelling around the heart and other secondary malformations. And suggested a considerable portion of the Gulf waters collected during the oil spill had pH concentrations above this threshold. It suggests that, that this is not just an academic exercise, but in reality that a lot of the fish populations in the Gulf at some point would have been exposed to concentrations that were high enough to elicit these cardiovascular impairments. And cardiovascular impairment, as you might expect, if your heart, if your tinker's not working very well, it's going to be a little difficult to do a lot of things. Okay? And so they found that even uh, subtle changes in cardiac function during exposure during embryos actually had long-lasting effects. And so animals, when they became adults, and this was actually looking at zebrafish, um, but regardless, all vertebrates, their cardiovascular development is very similar, that these animals had a hard time swimming. And so there is a, a clearly there's this cause and effect. There's, there's some, uh, some real, uh, real world uh, problems that the animal has to deal with, has to swim to collect its food and to evade predators. So in conclusion to this part, there was a large signal of hydrocarbon exposure that existed in uh, Louisiana marsh fish collected in situ. We saw that AHR pathway was upregulated and certainly we saw CYP1A protein highly output regulated in the gills and livers uh, from these fish. And the transcripts of that suggest potential for reduced reproductive capacity and alterations in cardiovascular physiology. Now kind of moving along uh, quickly in here, uh, this other study actually was kind of taking back on some of the samples that we had uh, collected, but also uh, took advantage of some additional sampling we did in 2011 and 2012. Basically, we did a lot of sampling, and I'm only going to focus in on a few sites. Uh, some of these were reference sites, some of these were oiled sites, uh, as Dr. Turner alluded to. The, the, the oiling was very patchy, but we had sites that were, as MBS here, had very low pHs in the sediment, and others that had uh, Wilkes and Bay had moderate oiling in the sediments, and Grand Terre had very high levels in the sediment in 2010, and reduced in 2011. Here's my graduate student at the time, uh, collecting sediment cores from the marsh edge. We basically took these sediments and we developed these mesocosm studies where we essentially took sediment and we overlaid it with uh, one-third strength seawater, clean seawater. Uh, these are Teflon back baskets that we basically would put our fish embryos so they would never sit immersed directly into the sediment. And so essentially these animals were in the overlying water, overlying the sediment. And in a nutshell, we basically here found that heart rate, which is a pretty good indicator of uh, cardiovascular function, was significantly reduced by about 30 to 35 percent, which is actually a very significant reduction. Uh, so in the Grand Terre uh, sites, 2010, there was a very large, there was slightly attenuated reduction in heart rate in the Grand Terre sediments collected in 2011, and com comparison to these other two sediment sites. So it seems to follow the dose response curve. Um, we looked at percentage hatch, and what we find here similarly is that when we expose the embryos to sediments collected from Grand Terre in 2010 and 2011, there was a very significant reduction in the ability of these embryos to go on to uh, survive and to develop and eventually to hatch. Okay. Now if we actually look at this, a more nuanced look at this, what we find here in red, these are the percentages of hatched and these are unhatched. So what we found is when we exposed these animals to very heavily contaminated sites, the animals remained within the chorion and here's the embryo inside its little eggshell there. It's still alive, it's not doing very well and it never actually hatches. Uh, uh, hatches. Essentially, it ha doesn't have enough vigor to actually escape its chorion. And so even though it's, uh, it's still alive, and really for all extents and purposes, it's, it's, it's dead. And so we hear a reduction in here. And if we basically, uh, and we also see from these, uh, within these embryos, is that we start to see a lot of al uh, alterations in the, the proper folding of the heart. So when we expose an, uh, embryos to high contam uh, contaminated sediments, what we start to see is the normal folding pattern, which shows this kind of L pattern of folding between the atria and the ventricle, tends to become uh, uh, straight. And so it, it, the heart is essentially not folding like it would. And so there's some alteration in the developmental process that allows it to, 
to fold that's not happening. As a result, the heart is not functioning. We start to see a lot of edemas around the heart. It's a little hard to see here. We see cranial facial uh, uh, abnormalities. We see a lot of instances of hemorrhage in the animals as well. In fact, when we look at uh, laboratory spike sediments, and here we're looking at total pH, we see this very nice correlation between the amount of polyaromatic hydrocarbons in spike sediments and percent hatch, and uh, concentration of pHs in the sediment and heart rate. We never get much below about a 30 to 40 percent reduction in heart rate, but these animals are essentially doomed for failure. Okay, they will essentially not develop, and as you can tell, they do not hatch at these, at these very high levels. And in fact, when we took laboratory spike sediment experiments, so we just essentially took the oil and mixed it with the sediments, uh, this almost fits uh, exactly with the, when we took the sediments from the field, brought them in the lab, measured the set of the pH concentrations, and developed similar concent uh, concentration curves. And so, exposure to field collected sediments increases time to hatch and reduces the percent hatch of killifish embryos. And we have these teratogenic or these developmental abnormalities in those, in those animals and certainly affected cardiova cardiovascular fitness. Now, what's next? Well, my group uh, has been funded uh, over the last couple of years by the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences. Somehow we managed to convince them that a, that a killifish is a vertebrate and uh, humans are vertebrates and so we can use a killifish to study human health. Um, this is actually a collaboration with uh, two of the folks, uh, Chris Green from the LSU Egg Center and Andrew Whitehead who is now at UC Davis, long-term collaborators of mine. And essentially, we're interested in this sort of, this early life development, how Exposure to early life development influence juvenile and adult performance, and also uh, uh, exposure to other environmental stressors, and how those are compromised by early life exposure to oil, and ultimately the, uh, the effects on reproduction, and ultimately that reproduction uh, and what uh, influences it has on early life development in the next generation. So we basically oil embryos and we look at uh, those animals during development. Okay, so looking at critical developmental stages and impacts on later life. Adult exposures in, uh, and, uh, to oil and the impacts on reproduction. Adult and early life exposures and those transgenerational effects. And so what effects eventually make it out to F2 and F3 generations. And so there's a lot of epigenetic effects that are not genetically inheritable but things like methylation of DNA or histomodifications that actually can uh, transmit effects across multiple generations. Uh, we're interested in mechanisms, and so I'm a physiologist, and so we're ultimately interested in understanding some of the underlying mechanisms. And one thing that I'm going to present a little bit of today is genetic variation and exposure history. And so the ability of that, this may either protect or sensitize individuals to oil exposure. So, in very quickly, what I'd like to do is talk about some unpublished work that we've, uh, we're currently working on, where we're basically collecting different populations of killifish from Florida through Texas, okay? Uh, three of these are shown in blue, are reference population, uh, St. Teresa, Florida, which I'm not gonna talk about at all anymore. Um, a population that was derived from southern Louisiana, which we actually have maintained culture at, at LSU Aquaculture Facility and Gangs Bayou, which is near Galveston, Texas. So these don't have any known history of oil or oiling or hydrocarbon exposure. This is in contrast to these shown in pink, uh, Grand Terre, Louisiana, collected in 2015, which is, we know is being oiled, and another population collected in Vince Bayou, Texas, which has a long history of hydrocarbon exposure. This is a U.S. Uh, Superfund site, and in fact, there's uh, data from Cole Matson's group suggesting that this population has become adapted. So it can actually tolerate orders of magnitude, higher concentrations of hydrocarbons that would normally kill this, this species of fish, okay? So we basically are use these, and I'm just gonna focus on the two uh, Louisiana and the two Texas populations. We've brought these into the lab and use this as a broodstock. And what we're able to do is take males and females uh, 
parental controls. They've never seen oil, and we can fertilize them and get embryos. We've also exposed parents, the males and females, to a WAF concentration, an oil to water concentration, for at least 40 days to about, it's about 50 ppb of uh, total polyaromatic hydrocarbons. And we once again fertilize and get the embryos. Interestingly, what we find is that when we look at fertilization success, okay, if we look at the parental populations that we don't, we collect from the field, but we don't expose them to oil, excellent fertilization. But 95% using our in vitro fertilization method, 95% of the eggs can be fertilized when we, we expose them to the, firm, uh, to the sperm. Okay? Interestingly, when we expose these parents to oil for 40 days, look at these populations from Louisiana and the Gangs Bayou. So these are reference population, reference population, population that's been exposed to deep water rising oil. Fertilization drops to 25%. All except this Vince Bayou, which comes from this highly contaminated site. When we expose those parents to oil, we still get excellent fertilization success. We now look at the embryos and expose them really as a stress test to look at exposing them to zero to 56% uh, WAF, 100% being two grams per liter of uh, a high energy WAF that we created. And we basically, if we look at Gangs Bayou, the parental control and the parental expose, we see a, a significant reduction in heart rate as we increase oil, like we would expect, and as I showed previously, but no difference really between the parental control and the parental exposed. Our Vince Bayou, which is our uh, population collected from that highly contaminated site, the heart rate is really refractory. We can expose them to very high levels of oil, no effect on heart rate, either in the parental controls or the parental exposed. Interestingly, when we take the Louisiana population, slightly higher heart rate in the parental control, but they seem to be more sensitive. We're actually seeing a significant reduction in heart rate, both in the parental controls and the parental exposed embryos. Embryos exposed, uh, collected from parentally exposed animals. We see a significant reduction, and this reduction in heart rate is actually greater than we found in, found in the Texas population. When we look at the Grand Tear, the, parental, uh, the, the embryos collected from the parental control parents, once again, like the Louisiana, the, our aquaculture population, they're also very sensitive. Notice that I have no pink bars. Pink bars is because those in, individuals that didn't get fertilized, they didn't survive. They didn't survive even when they weren't exposed subsequently to oil. And so there's something about this Grand Terre population when we subsequently expose them to uh, oil, expose the parents to oil, the embryos, even those that survive and fer are fertilized, don't go on to survive. This is at, uh, at four days post-exposure. And so, conclusion, genetic variation in exposure history can either protect or sensitize individuals to subsequent oil exposure. So it's something that we really need to get a, a handle on is really understanding population variation in the sensitivity. Um, there's a lot of information here, but F1 embryos from Louisiana populations appear to be more sensitive than those collected from Texas. The F0 adults, those the adults uh, from the adapted population are recalcitrant to deep water rising oil. In other words, they retain high reproductive capacity. And similarly, F1 embryos from these adaptive populations uh, is more resistant to cardiovascular teratogenesis or these developmental effects. So I'd like to thank uh, the Whitehead Group, the Green Lab, and, and just a few of the members of Galvez Lab. Really, we're a pretty large operation. I could take a whole page here to fill those in, but I have a good group of undergraduates and graduate students that keep the, the forward running when I'm not there. Okay, thank you very much. Sensitized, trained, does recover, 
with no history. Um, how long does it last? Is it just that generation, or is it carried forward? You know, there's some indications that you know, we talk about these epigenetic effects, and so these are things that you may see in the news. Is that what happens when maternally, when your mothers are exposed to some contaminant, and yeah. what are the downstream effects? There, there appears to be some indication that that there is this epigenetic effect where there's these modifications that happen around the genes associated with this HR pathway. That you know, these include methylation of regions of the the DNA or histone modifications that it actually has long-lasting transgenerational effects. And in fish, we don't know. It's really, there's, there's, uh, there's been no follow-up on the, that pathway. There's a group at uh, Woods Hole, uh, Mark Hahn, who uh, is currently looking at that, and we're actually interested in following up on some, some of these pathways as well. But there's really, it hasn't been too much work. Is, uh, it, is it reasonable? Excuse me? Is it reasonable to carry forward? Or? Everything's reasonable if you have a budget. If you have a budget and you have the manpower, yeah. But certainly, um, so to get your effect, you know, within a in our populations, we really haven't bulked on the washout where we've exposed the animals and then hit the decline course uh, washout. In other words, reduction in SIP one e expression. All of these have been collected. So when we go in the field in 2011, 2012, these animals have a very, very large sip one expression in the gills, in the liver, in the kidneys, and in the intestine. The intestine is, these are very high expression. Um, so these animals, uh, marine fish drink, unlike freshwater fish, marine fish drink, and so there's likely some ingestion in either, uh, of water, but also particulate matter, and, and certainly through the food where it might but these animals are showing expression. And this is in the face of reduced pH concentrations in the field. So you expect that these signals are, are relatively long fit. Another question for Dr. Galvez? Okay, it's a hungry crowd, right? <laughs> All right, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Starting up the um, recovery and restoration uh, look into the marsh after Deepwater Horizon, we've got Dr. Deepak Mishra visiting us from University of Georgia. Thanks, Emily. Uh, thank you for the invitation. This is great. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to uh, give this talk. Uh, but I'm going to share with you the capability of remote sensing uh, as a tool to be able to monitor this marsh ecosystem more effectively. Uh, I don't have any GOMRI funding now, so my GOMRI funding ended in 2012, uh, so, but I have been getting funding from NSF and NASA to be able to continue this research. Uh, so. Uh, all the results will be uh, for the oil spill related work will be up to 2012. Then I'll basically talk about a more you know, general remote sensing based approach to map uh, or monitor <coughs> marsh biophysical parameters. Okay, um, I'm from University of Georgia. I manage the remote sensing and field spectroscopy lab uh, over there. Uh, so before I go into the talk, I just want to give you a, you know, quick pitch about remote sensing, why you know we use remote sensing, what's the you know idea. I think you might have seen this before. Uh, it's basically uh, you know cost effective. So you can monitor a particular patch of wetland or a particular area you know frequently, every week, every month, daily. Uh, you know, we have satellites in space uh, that you know, does daily twice, you know, once in the morning, once in the afternoon. Uh, so that increases your chances of getting cloud-free, good quality data uh, for frequent monitoring. Uh, 
And then it, you know, so that's, you know, that's the idea of multi-temporal coverage. And then it can make inferences about inaccessible areas, okay? So those are those things that I think we know uh, in the, the beauty of remote sensing. It's not an exact science, I just want to be clear, not like Brian's biogeochemistry. Uh, so, uh, you know, 15, 20% error in uh, you know, doing things from space is pretty okay. Uh, so, uh, I do a slightly little bit, uh, you know, different types of remote sensing. So, basically combining field and lab-based spectroscopy, which is basically remote sensing from few inches. Uh, you know, remote sensing is, as long as you're not touching the target, you're doing remote sensing. So, um, you know, few inches, few feet, you know, you get controlled data set and then you scale it up to satellite level, you know, measurements. Uh, so, uh, you know, the process of field spectroscopy, you know, we call it proximal sensing. Uh, it's basically your close proximity to your target. Uh, the biggest source of error in remote sensing data set is the atmosphere, okay? Uh, somebody's noise is somebody's signal, right? So our noise is atmosphere, which is signal to atmospheric scientists. Uh, so uh, what atmosphere does is add a lot of extra extraneous scattering to the remote sensing signal. So your uh, uh, you know, spectra or spectral signature from the target get really diluted when it you know goes through this two-way traffic of uh, sunlight coming through the atmosphere, hitting the target, and going back in the space again to the satellite, right? Uh, so by doing field spectroscopy, proximal sensing, you can actually examine the interaction of EMR, which is electromagnetic radiation, with the target and develop spectral models. Those spectral models can be then upscaled to whether it's drone or aircraft or you know, uh, satellite-based uh, altitude. Uh, and it also you know, uh, helps us validate the satellite maps, products. You know, we don't want to send out a map without accuracy number attached to it. So uh, these field measurements will you know, let us do that. So uh, this is one of those uh, you know, sampling photographs uh, in uh, Marsh Point, Mississippi, uh, during the height of the oil spill. So we go there and we uh, calibrate our sensor with a known reflectance panel, and then we put it up, and then we start collecting data from our different marshes, a different uh, degree of oiling, whenever we got access to the oiling site. Most of the time we didn't. But uh, you know, that's the idea. Uh, so you know, a little backstory. I was a graduate. I joined as a uh, graduate student in University of Nebraska Lincoln. So first couple of years, I did remote sensing of corn, soybean. So uh, that's a really fancy platform with a lot of sensors hanging out and basically looking at the you know yield or you know whatever of corn. I got really bored and I got a complete U-turn to remote sensing underwater. <laughs> so I did a lot of you know National Geographic style work, you know scuba diving and looking at remote sensing of coral. You know I kept the letter C from corn to coral. <laughs> so uh, this is also remote sensing. You can see we put a tripod really close to the coral. This is Rotan Island, Honduras. So uh, the the tripod, the sensor is not touching the coral. It's very close to the coral. So we wanted to see the photosynthetic activity in the coral. Uh, from for eight hours, okay, from uh, sun going from you know, uh, uh, you know covering the you know, uh, so different de degree of sun angle. You know? So we did a lot of uh, you know experiments. Uh, uh, you know we're from Nebraska, so we didn't have any marine science background. But we you know that's one of my that's chapter four of my dissertation where I call it I call this instrument ABD all body defense. <laughs> so. This is basically a you know, buoy system we, you know, with few sensors looking up, few sensors looking down. And the idea is if all these divers will you know, release the rope at the same time, and the rope has markings, then the whole system moves up and it starts to see more and more coral. And so seeing more and more coral will give us a better representation at the satellite level. Okay? It's very difficult to match point measurement with a pixel. So you have to have a footprint which is representative of the satellite pixel, okay? So uh, then I got a job in Southeast and I didn't have corn, neither coral, so I reached a compromise and I'll do wetlands, just in between land and water. So <laughs> that's what we do now, uh, remote sensing wetlands in various ways. Um, okay, so now going back to the uh, actual uh, wetland monitoring. 
we know the ecological, economical value of wetlands from you know, nutrient trapping to uh, uh, storing large amount of carbon to uh, you know, providing fresh water, uh, flood water reduction, attenuating storm surge. So we know all that you know, background information. Uh, you might have seen these kind of uh, photographs from in websites. Uh, they show the uh, the degree of defragmentation in the wetlands from you know 1800 to you know, uh, uh, 1993 in this example. Uh, but you know you might have seen the USGS projections, which is up to 2050. Uh, so that is 2050. Uh, <clears throat> the, the 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 marshes that are prone to be you know lost. Uh, and wh where are they located in terms of the Louisiana coastline. So we were aware of the land loss problem in Louisiana. I mean, there are uh, lots of statistics mainly happening because of engineering modifications to the landscape, to uh, relative sea level rise, uh, climate change induced. Uh, so my idea was to go beyond the land loss, land gain, to something a little more uh, ecological, which is basically looking at the biophysical properties. Uh, which basically tells uh, the, about the photosynthetic uh, capacity, the physiological status of these wetlands over the years. So, uh, and uh, we know about the BP oil spill, approximately 206 million gallons of crude oil, uh, the first major U.S. oil spill to affect marsh uh, in that you know, extent. Uh, and, you know, so the immediate impact, you know, as predicted, loss in green biomass, so a lot of browning happened, uh, you know, reduction in photosynthetic capacity, oil coats the leaf and canopy and then reduces the photosynthetic activity, uh, thus turning the marsh yellow in the middle of the growing season. Um, and then impact of the cleaning effort for the, you know, burning, flushing and skimming. So these are the photographs you know, taken in the field uh, in 2011, uh, 10 uh, and at some in 11. Uh, so, the, uh, so right after the spill, I got funded from NSF and uh, Gomri, uh, the bridge funds, to uh, to look at to basically continue this work because I think we are one of those groups uh, who got funded in 2009 before the spill to do this exact same work from NASA. So we have been collecting field data since 2009. So it basically to keep it going. Uh, so the idea was to look at four parameters. So the biophysical parameters that can be mapped from space and they tell a lot about the marsh uh, other than just you know, uh, area loss, area gain. Uh, those four parameters are canopy chlorophyll content, uh, the total amount of chlorophyll A which drives the photosynthesis, uh, then green biomass which is above ground, anything green, okay, uh, weight per uh, area. And then uh, you know leaf area index, which is uh, you know amount of leaf exposed to the sunlight. So that means that directly affect the the intersection of light to the uh, to the leaf, uh, which drives the photosynthesis. Uh, and then green vegetation fraction. So basically, how much green, how much everything else, brown or yellow or whatever. So uh, to use remote sensing data to develop models and then scale up those models to be able to map it and map it every week since 2000 to 2015. So we're looking at 5,000, 6,000 maps for the entire Gulf Coast. So you can click on a pixel, any area, and you get a, a really high frequency construction weekly for 15 years uh, to see the signatures of hurricanes, uh, tropical storms, prolonged drought, oil spill, and whatever else is happening in that uh, you know, region or that patch is experiencing over the years. Uh, so the idea is that these products, uh, you know, can identify hotspots, can basically, uh, you know, coastal resource managers can use it to identify candidates which are, uh, uh, you know, uh, prioritized for restoration projects, you know, things like that. Uh, okay, so the field method works very simple. It's basically incoming sunlight and how much light is being reflected from the target. In this case, it's marsh canopy, right? Uh, so uh, basically radiance over irradiance, so we use a dual sensor approach. If you use a single sensor that is looking down the marsh, then every time it becomes cloudy or shaded, then you have to recalibrate your sensor. So dual sensor approach, what it does, it basically gives you relative reflectance. Anytime it becomes cloudy, the reflectance goes down, so it gets normalized. Uh, 
So uh, this is this is the frame we used. We tested a lot, a lot of frames. Uh, this is the frame we use because it, this is the you know frame that gives us the footprint of 2.2 meter diameter. So IFOV is the instantaneous field of view of the sensor. That means how much area it's looking at. It's always look at a circle, and that is a 2.2 meter diameter. So if you can take enough reading uh, of 2.2 meter readings uh, on a marsh patch and then you average them out, then they might represent a satellite pixel more accurately, okay? Taking one reading might not do the job, so you have to optimize, and you have to find out what is the representative number of readings in a particular pixel, whether it is Landsat or MODIS or any other sensor. So it will depend on the spatial resolution of the sensor, which is the pixel size. Uh, so, you know, so we calibrate the sensor, we, uh, you know, the sensor has a uh, laser pointer, so it will always point to the middle of the scan. Then we have the PVC pipe that represents the total, you know, scan area. And then we do cookie cutting to find out the exact you know, area that the sensor scanned. And you do that enough so that uh, until you get a close match with your satellite data uh, in terms of uh, pixel uh, reflectance pattern. Okay. Uh, so uh, basically we use multiple sensors. Some of the sensors are really light and tiny, so they can be mounted on this frame uh, like this and look at a you 2.2 know, meter diameter area. But some of the sensors are backpack systems, which are much heavier, like 50 pound or so. Uh, so they cannot be mounted, but they're very, very accurate. So we also you know, take multiple scans with that within the field of view, just to make sure that you know, uh, there's no uh, you know, outlier. So uh, overall, uh, before and during and after the oil spill, uh, we collected a lot and lots. I call it spaghetti plots, uh, a lot of spectra. And uh, you know, the objective was to basically let's develop two types of model. One is a spectral model for each species individually, because when you are looking at the marsh from such a close distance, they have a lot of species signature. Okay, so the reflectance changes because you know NIR light which is totally controlled by the leaf structure, canopy architecture. It's nothing to do with pigments, okay? Only the visible light, they get absorbed by the pigment for photosynthesis, but NIR gets scattered around based on the leaf area and you know, other you know, structure. So, uh, so uh, the species signature is very, very strong in, in situ data, which is you know, proximal sensing data. But as you go up in space, uh, up in the altitude, the species signature get diluted. So no matter how much variability in terms of canopy structure in marsh grass, uh, the satellite reflectance doesn't change, which is a blessing in disguise to be able to do a species invariant model, uh, which is not sensitive to you know, uh, changing species. Of course, if you, you know, find a big patch of jungles, which is really dark compared to Spartina, then there'll be some differences. But overall, uh, that species variability is lost, uh, in, in basically with altitude. So uh, whenever you do this remote sensing data collection, you have to do a lot of biophysical in situ data collection to be able to calibrate and validate your models. So uh, this is, for example, the leaf chlorophyll uh, content. Leaf chlorophyll can be transformed to canopy chlorophyll uh, depending on you know, uh, the area of the leaf and stuff like that. Uh, we do LAI readings, uh, which is leaf area index. Uh, so leaf area index reading is pretty simple. You take a couple of readings from the top of the canopy and bunch of readings from different angles in the bottom of the canopy and the amount of sunlight that is lost from the top of the canopy to the bottom of the canopy is basically used in something you know which is photosynthesis and uh, so that's how you convert the FPAR which is fraction of photosynthetic active radiation into leaf area index. Um, this is the wedge fraction I was talking about. Wedge fraction is that that frame has a digital camera on it so it will look at the exact area that got scanned uh, and then, you know, that area will be converted to wedge fraction. So basically it's a pixel counting, simple, uh, you know, uh, MATLAB code that counts how many green pixels and how many everything else. So in this case, it's 86%, okay? Uh, in this case, it's 42% and so on. So every spectra we collected, every remote sensing data we collected had all these biophysical parameters associated with them uh, for model validation and calibration. Uh, you know, we did biomass destructive sampling uh, and then separating the green versus brown and, you know, drying the green, weighing the green and, and all those things. Um, 
So basically, you know, that's the kind of data we got. So this is taken from the frame, which is looking at two different, you know, marsh, uh, you know, footprint, and then two different spectra, uh, saying something about the footprint. More area of water exposed, then the NIR goes down. Uh, you know, more marsh exposed, then NIR goes up, and so on. We saw many uninvited guests in our you know, during field trips. So. I have tons and tons of pictures of creatures <laughs> than spectra. Okay, so uh, in oil spill, uh, during oil spill time, we didn't have access to the uh, field most of the time. So what we'll do is, you know, really early in the morning, around seven, we'll charter a, you know, a, you know, a single engine plane and go look around where are the yellow tapes because they'll put yellow tapes in the, uh, those areas. They cleaned up, and we basically, you know, kind of roughly record the GPS readings and try to go to those sites. And we went to a bunch of those sites, and you know, so you know, marsh impact was you know, obvious. In some cases, they're totally coated with the uh, oil. Some cases, the root structure is uh, affected by the oil. Uh, and you know, here we are taking biomass sample, and you can see you know, sign of oil uh, all over in those marshes. Uh, so here's the spectral signature in terms of magnitude of oil. Uh, so when uh, so interesting thing we noticed that uh, between healthy marsh and moderately oiled and severely oiled marsh is that the sign of a uh, healthy vegetation is the strong absorption of light at 675 nanometer, which is basically the characteristic chlorophyll A absorption uh, feature. Uh, so if the marsh has got a lot of oiling in it. Uh, that means it's under stress, that means it's not photosynthesizing that effectively, then the 675 nanometer absorption will start reflecting more and more light, okay? Uh, so the less prominent the 675 nanometer absorption feature, that means more uh, contamination or more oiling in that. And that was pretty obvious in the uh, field data we collected. Uh, so, uh, looking at it, I'm not going to go into detail uh, on these modeling aspects, but looking at the, the models, uh, you see a strong species signature in the in situ models. Uh, so, different species, batis, disticulus, juncus, salicon, uh, spartina, alternoflora patents. Uh, so, they have different, you know, uh, uh, performance uh, in terms of simple biomass model in this case. Uh, but that performance is uh, that those lines actually come together when you look at you know satellite data and uh, uh, start modeling from the satellite uh, altitude. Uh, you know different species, different correlation in uh, in situ data, uh, which is taken from the frame, which is you know 16 feet uh, altitude. Uh, so okay, so that was the field component. So in 2012, I just wanted to see the short-term quantitative estimate of oil impact. So basically a change detection project between 2009, 10 and 11 to see what has happened. Um, and you know, that was published in Remote Sensing Environment. And uh, these are those Landsat data we could get. So you have to be careful uh, with the Landsat uh, in terms of, you know, because there are 16 days temporal resolution. So, so there is a lot of, you know, tide, you have to look at the tide, uh, you have to look at the uh, cloud cover. So getting, uh, you know, common area Landsat for a you know a large scale change detection project is very very difficult because not all areas are going to be equally clouded. Uh, but you need so the first uh, rule of change detection you have to have a common minimum area between you know, these images so that you can do the uh, you know change algorithm. So those are our you know 2009 and 2010 uh, Landsat uh, dates. Uh, pretty close. So uh, the another rule of change detection is that you have to have anniversary dates. Uh, or you know, close to that. So we got uh, pretty close to that uh, in terms of monthly change. Uh, the other aspect of satellite remote sensing is to remove the atmospheric signal, which is by itself is a big field in remote sensing to remove the atmospheric scattering and absorption by atmospheric gases, the aerosols, the water vapor. Uh, so we did a model on, it's called flash atmospheric model. So you can see the comparison between Landsat data, which is the solid line, and then the you know, proximal sensing data. So, so if this step goes wrong, then all the rest of the modeling is basically wrong. Uh, so you have to come really close to the you know, uh, in situ level to be able to run these models. Anyway, so we ran a lot of vegetation models uh, on top of that. Uh, you know, marsh is a pretty difficult environment to model on because of mainly water impact. Uh, so what happens is that when there is a, a satellite is looking at a lot of water background, the NIR is 
trying to absorb because NIR gets absorbed almost 100% in water, but NIR get reflected a lot in vegetation. So NIR is basically struggling uh, between water and vegetation whether to reflect or to absorb and so it's basically not that prominent like terrestrial grasses, but it's not that you know, uh, you know, uh, subdued either. So it's basically in the 20-25%. You know, uh, so some of these models we got decent results and we just went with that and here's the validation. The validation is a you know, person normalized RMAC is around you know, highest uh, error was 12% in this Landsat modeling study. Uh, so if you take that model and apply it to your 2009 image and your 2010 image and perform a simple change detection, this is what we got. Uh, we got a lot of red pixels, but we wanted to have a really conservative estimate uh, compensating for all the errors, which is highest is 12%. So we basically said, okay, show us all the areas which are experiencing a decrease in canopy chlorophyll less than, greater than 20 milligram per square meter, okay? Don't show us any other, you know, uh, 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 any area that is experiencing decrease uh, less than 20, okay? Give us the real conservative estimate. So those are the pixels that got highlighted that experienced a decrease within that, you know, year uh, from 2009 to 2010. Uh, of you know at least you know more than 20 uh, you know milligram per square meter. Uh, in terms of biomass, you know very similar, very corresponding change. But those uh, marsh patches that got experienced lower chlorophyll content also decreased in green biomass. Okay, uh, so that was the you know first immediate quantitative assessment. We also looked at multiple parameters. You can you know read the paper. It's uh, you know we'll look at rainfall, uh, we'll look at temperature, we we'll look at PDSI, which is a uh, you know, drought index, and everything. Uh, 2009 and 2010 were pretty comparable year. Uh, not any hurricanes in either years. Um, so uh, you know uh, we can safely isolate this is the spill impact uh, on those you know marsh patches. Okay, within a year. Uh, then in 2011, we noticed that the, most of these patches are back to the 2009 level in terms of above ground canopy chlorophyll or biomass, all, all those properties. So I cannot tell you that this continued in 2011. Uh, it was, you know, slightly less red pixels, not, you know, like this much, but there are only few patches remain in 2011 that continued, you know, experiencing decrease in canopy chlorophyll or green biomass or all the other two biophysical parameters. So uh, the decrease in area, how, how much area experienced that decrease? Uh, in 2009, you know, it is like 50 square kilometer, which is, you know, uh, attributed to the natural variability in the marsh and uh, some patches. But in 2010, it was a, you know, significant increase up to 400, 420 square kilometer area that experienced that decrease uh, in the middle of the growing season, okay? So these models are built for growing season only from April to October. And in the middle of the growing season, the uh, you know, 450 square kilometer area is experiencing either a decrease of 20% uh, in canopy chlorophyll or green biomass. So we, uh, you know, looked at few, uh, you know, uh, pixels of marshes, fringing marshes and interior marshes. Uh, we saw some interesting trend and that trend actually didn't change that much from pixel to pixel to pixel. Uh, in the fringing marshes, you can see the immediate impact uh, of the spill. So this is the phenology, so how the growing season, you know, should be like a sine curve, you know, peak growing season in August, September and then slowly declining. Um, but in the uh, immediate impact in the fringing marshes, you can see in June, uh, and then uh, start to, you know, recovering some of those patches, maybe they got cleared, they got, you know, uh, well, you know cleaned, and in interior marshes, there's a time lag, so you can see the decline in August, okay, late July and August, uh, so, you know, looking at uh, some of the other modeling results, it made sense, uh, you know, oil took time to, you know, get into those intertidal waterways to affect the interior marshes. Uh, and the similar results were seen in another satellite, which is MODIS. MODIS is the satellite that covers the area daily twice. Once in the uh, morning around 10 a.m. MODIS Terra and once in the afternoon at 2.15 uh, MODIS Aqua. So you can see the similar response uh, 
uh, uh, MODIS derived LAI. MODIS is a little bit coarser resolution pixel, it's 250 meter by 250 meter. So uh, you're getting a lot of averaging out effect in MODIS. Uh, okay, so uh, now I will, uh, so since then, uh, we, uh, I realized that we need to do a long term uh, analysis of these you know, marsh habitats. And the only way you can do it is not by using Landsat, which is pretty patchy. There is cloud cover, there is every 16 days, you know, if, if it is cloudy day, happens to be on the 16th day, then we get a really you know, cloudy image. So MODIS is the way to go uh, because of the temporal frequency and MODIS provide a 8 day cloud free image. Uh, so it, uh, surface reflectance which is downloadable for free, uh, 250 meter and also 500 meter. So uh, th that project was implemented in Georgia, uh, similar marsh gradient, uh, mainly Spatina dominated ecosystem, uh, basically you know, collecting similar in situ data. Uh, you know, that time I moved to Georgia, so it was hard to come back to Louisiana to do field work. Uh, so you know, collecting ground data, collecting NWI, which is National Wetland Inventory, uh, wetland you know, areas, cropping the satellite data, then running the model, uh, you know, then weekly, monthly map composites, and then doing a you know uh, post time series analysis of phenology, uh, or you know weekly and uh, you know monthly maps. So basically, phenology like that and maps like that. Okay, so that is possible using MODIS, and here is the animation that shows weekly uh, distribution, spatio-temporal distribution of any biophysical parameters, those four or five uh, biophysical parameters uh, that you can do uh, using MODIS data. Okay, so this is uh, in showing the growing season, then senescence, uh, you know, whatever is happening in uh, Georgia coast. So similar model, uh, you know, can be implemented to uh, Louisiana coast or Gulf coast. I'll show you some of that result. And you get a lot and lot of information. It's kind of big data project uh, where you, you know, can analyze a patch uh, for 15 years because MODIS is available since 2000. It was launched in 2000. So 2000 to 2015. Uh, you know, we did some other interesting analysis, you know, uh, we uh, uh, overlaid those phenology to with drought, you know, Georgia affected by drought quite a bit. Uh, so these yellow boxes are the drought years and every time there is a drought year, you can see the overall biophysical you know, parameters went down. Uh, you know, not very strong correlation, but significant one uh, with PDSI uh, for those dieback sites. You know, for example, you know, Georgia has dieback sites uh, that is managed by the DNR. Uh, people say a bunch of reasons affecting the dieback. Uh, one of the reasons is maybe uh, drought, and uh, this is the correlation of dieback sites with drought. Uh, you know, it's, it's significant. Uh, so we can actually do a overall trend analysis of a particular marsh patch to see how they are behaving in terms of uh, you know uh, in the last 15 years. Whether uh, you know you can compute something called phenometrics, the length of the growing season every year or the peak of the growing season. Is the peak of the growing season moving to September or October or moving back? So you can do a lot of analysis from this phenological data uh, from models. So we have those data sets available for you to analyze. You can pick, you can give me lat long of your site, I can give you a phenology for 15 years. Okay, so these are the maps. For example, I'll show you these are the maps we have in our archive. This is pre-Hurricane Gustav uh, and this is post-Hurricane Gustav. Okay, so hurricane impacts are the most severe on those marshes. Immediate signature change uh, in the in the, the marshes. Uh, this is post Katrina, uh, pre Katrina. This is post Katrina. So you can actually overlay the track of the hurricane, and you can see the you know, the you know you can analyze the strongest side of the hurricane, and then you see the impact after you get a cloud-free image. The very next uh, eighth day or sixteenth day. Um, so, you know, if you zoom in into those uh, map products, you see a lot more detail. Uh, for example, you can put a hurricane track and see zoomed in levels of, you know, uh, pre-post hurricane analysis. You can do uh, same with Katrina, you know, a lot more severe impact. Uh, so, uh, here is how it happens. So, you have this 6,000 maps in a database and you can uh, take your lat long or you can take your uh, area of whether it is a restoration site or whatever and you can construct these phenological plots. Of course these are an you know, average of multiple pixels but you can then overlay your 
you know, so these data sets, this drought is downloaded from the National Drought Mitigation Center. Uh, these are these hurricane signature. You can see Hurricane Isaac here, slight dip. And you can zoom in on those uh, phenology plots to a year or two years and you know, look at it in more detail. Uh, this is for two, uh, uh, 250 meter data and this is for you know, 500 meter data uh, for the entire Gulf Coast uh, South Marshes. Okay, so uh, you know conservation restoration imp uh, implications. Personally, I like to see uh, analyze more the effectiveness of restoration projects. You know, we have a lot of restoration projects going on in the Gulf Coast in Louisiana. So we can do a pre-post restoration uh, analysis, or you can do a trend whether it has actually improved in terms of you know photosynthetic activity for you know uh, physiological stress, uh, whether it has improved uh, restoration has improved the marsh uh, you know, health or productivity trend. Um, so, you know, this methodology facilitated prioritization of conservation and restoration efforts, uh, you know, predictive ability to, so this is where we are headed now in terms of research, uh, predictive capability with respect to carbon sequestration in these ecosystems. Okay, so carbon sequestration uh, uh, literature, if you scan through those, uh, you know, a lot of them link to vegetation index like NDVI and stuff like that. Vegetation index for uh, wetlands, they don't work that great. So my argument is if you replace this vegetation index with biophysical parameters like LAI, then it will, you know, link very well to productivity. So take these biophysical parameters and then link it to CO2 flux, okay. So this is our ongoing project right now in the in Louisiana Mississippi coast, funded by NASA Roses, that is to look at the carbon sequestration potential of these marshes by installing flux towers and taking uh, long-term data for two years every 30 minutes. Uh, so we want to be able to answer questions like which species more efficiently sequester carbon, what happens to the carbon sequestration potential of wetlands after natural anthropogenic disasters. You know, we would be able to tell you in terms of carbon not in terms of area loss, area gain, but in terms of carbon loss to the atmosphere, okay? Uh, what is the effectiveness of a particular respiration project? Uh, so we, uh, you know, uh, this project is already ongoing. Uh, we have built the you know, boardwalk, one in Grand Bay, one in uh, Bay Sauvage in Louisiana. So uh, you can see that's the flux tower. Uh, it gives us data every half an hour, so CO2 flux. So basically you take the net ecosystem exchange and you subtract the nighttime respiration, you get the gross primary productivity of the marshes. And then you can, the idea is to be able to create a uh, GPP spatiotemporal map to be able to say carbon sink, carbon source, which areas are hotspots or going through degradation. Um, and so we do a lot of uh, drone work now, recreation, we're not doing it for research uh, of the site. And, uh, you know, uh, this is going to, you know, get more involved with more newer, cheaper and lighter sensors coming into the market. Uh, in, so it will be a you know, platform in between our satellite and in situ uh, sensors. So I am a big proponent of reproducible research. So everything we do in the lab is uh, documented in the website and we produce a detailed guidance manual for each of those models. So all you need to do, because all this satellite data is taxpayer, you know, free data. Anybody can download. You don't even need a login ID or password. So you can download, you can download the guidance manual starting from unzipping the files to producing the maps. Uh, so everything is uh, in the guidance manual that anybody can, you know, uh, have a free access to software like QGIS can be able to, you know, reproduce. Uh, so a lot of people to thank, a lot of agencies uh, funded uh, this work and funding currently in this work. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Take questions, but before that, I want to run something in the background. Uh, now you can ask questions. This is this is a drone image, drone movie. I, one of those you know, marsh patches. Uh, you can see the drone starts running. Now it will take off. And it's very stable. It gives us. Uh, we use it to basically look at alligator nests before we start walking in the marsh. <laughs> But this can be used. So this is from our drone, which is super stable. Now we have techniques, photogrammetric techniques, where you can take this you know, video and extract photographs every fraction of a second and create a 3D model of the marsh, which basically can be a proxy for the standing biomass. Okay? So that's called, that technique is called structure from motion. 
uh, and it's really popular nowadays. So maybe next time I can show you some biomass uh, approximation from the drone. Thank you. We take two questions for Dr. Mishra. Can you do LIDAR on the drone? Yes. So the idea is to do LIDAR kind of, uh, LIDAR type of you know, product from the drone. So the idea is not to take vertical photographs, but a low public photograph. And there has to be some oh. Yeah, so uh, you can do exactly LIDAR type of point clouds from these drones. Uh, but there are a couple of rules. You have to have at least 60 to 70 percent overlap between photographs. So it's always recommended to take video instead of photograph because you get more overlap and then you extract every five, uh, you know, 0.05 seconds or whatever uh, and then create a point cloud. But another rule is you have to have a little oblique photograph, you know, like 80, uh, 75 degree instead of 90 so that you can see the side. And if there is a lot of texture in the photograph, then you can create a point cloud. And I have tons of examples. I teach a class on structure for motion, where people, uh, you know, students just go out, take digital photographs, and make uh, you know three D models. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of softwares out there that can you know actually do that. So, yeah, for sure. And you know these drones are uh, exploding right now uh, because uh, now we have a, a sensor which is like our in situ hyperspectral sensor that that is imaging and that can be mounted on the drone. Uh, the only uh, classified information is the inertial navigation system, where you you know upload a flight path and tell the drone to go from point A to point B without any you know help. Uh, so that is the only thing that is you know uh, classified. But everything else you know taking hyperspectral data, putting it in a differential GPS to georeference the data is... Uh, Can you see the bar or all the camera? I mean, it depends on the camera, uh, you know, uh, and depends on the water quality. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, if the water is clear and uh, you have a, you know, blue band, then you should be able to see the water. One more question? You have to ask one more question. <laughs> Well, uh, the effect of the oil spill on the above ground, uh, you know, uh, photosynthetic activity in terms of biophysical parameters is we're not seeing it uh, since 2011. That was the immediate short-term impact. But uh, uh, it depends on uh, you know how what is the effect of the degradation of the oil in the uh, uh, soil uh, and uh, what's its impact on the uh, uh, on the wetlands productivity. But so far, uh, the above ground uh, stuff is not showing any sign. So uh, the idea is to keep on monitoring to see whether it can be isolated. All right. Thank you. That's All right. Another round of applause for Dr. Welcome our last speaker, Dr. Scott Zagel, um, who drove in all the way from Pensacola, who will then drive all the way back and then hop on a flight to DC tomorrow morning. So thank you so much for coming to be here. Um, Test this out, make sure I've got it in okay. All right, so I'm Scott. Uh, I know we're after lunch and last uh, talk of the day, so hopefully you can hang in there. Um, I want to talk about uh, deep water horizon oil spill, some of the more heavily oiled areas, and the shoreline response or shoreline cleanup activities that took place, and also uh, we'll touch on some restoration activities. Um, and all this was done, at least what I'm going to present in this talk. From a treatment testing perspective, I'm going to focus on one of our uh, main test areas where we worked out a lot of these techniques. Now this talk is something I do for a lot of the NOAA training classes for spill responders. Um, this is about an hour long um, 
presentation, but I'm going to cut it down to about 30 minutes or less. And what we'll do is we'll skim through this first one. I want to basically show you some of the photographs and give you a sense for what the oiling conditions look like in this area, as well as um, some idea what some of the response techniques were. And then we'll get into a little bit of data and look at recovery through about four years. So this set of slides shows the initial oiling conditions. This is June 2010. These are in and around Bay Jimmy or, or in general northern Barataria Bay. Uh, we had um, heavy uh, layers of emulsified oil or mousse entering these marshes on the vegetation and on the substrate. At this point in the emergency response, we still had oil being released from the wellhead. We, um, we still had a lot of oil on the water surface. So response was focused on getting that gross kind of bulk oiling on the shoreline or in nearshore waters so it didn't spread to other areas. A little bit later, once the well, once we had source control, once there was no longer oil on the water and no threat of oil uh, coming ashore from the surface waters, we kind of got into another phase of the response. We were looking at kind of site-specific and also habitat-specific cleanup endpoints and looking at methods to approach that. At this point, especially in this area, we had a kind of a unique oiling conditions where we had three things going on. We had heavily oiled, heavily oiled moose saturated rack lines. We had heavily oiled vegetation mats where the vegetation was dead and laid over and starting to harden up into like a tarry coat. And then we had uh, oil that moose or emulsified oil trapped under that vegetation material on the marsh substrate as well. I'll give you a sense of what that looked like with, with photos. So, this set of shots shows that oiled vegetation mat that laid over vegetation. You can see how kind of extreme or severe the, uh, the uh, effects are here. And then this slide shows what was underneath the oil material. So this is basically that, that uh, moose or emulsified oil material, centimeter thick or more in, in much of northern Barataria Bay. And this in that photo on the bottom right is about um, two to three centimeters thick, trapped under that kind of hardening, tarry uh, vegetation mat. I'll skip most of this slide, but this kind of harkens back to what uh, Dr. Twilley spoke about before. You know, do no additional harm. Most cases in marsh, uh, marsh oiled marsh cleanup, we talk about natural recovery or no treatment at all, let it recover naturally. That works in a lot of cases. Um, so we always have that in the back of our mind, do no additional harm. The situation with deep water, especially in these very heavily oiled marshes in northern Barataria Bay and a few other areas, is the, the oiling conditions were so severe that didn't seem to be an option. We weren't seeing much early natural recovery. There's a lot of oil in these marshes. And some of the more less intensive or some of the less intensive cleanup options we might look at, low pressure flushing, use of sorbents, weren't really very effective at all at, at removing or improving the conditions. So what we did is we went to, because the traditional methods weren't working, we wanted to look at other options, but those were going to be more intense and more aggressive. First thing we did, we went to a testing phase where we tried to test things on kind of a realistic scale, but on a small enough scale where we could also replicate, have controls, and see what worked best, but also have a look at um, what the environmental effects were as well, so that we tried to, to keep ourselves from doing um, more damage. This slide just shows the overall affected area. All the areas in red had these heavy levels of oiling that I kind of showed you in the pictures. Um, the area we're going to mainly focus on and look at the treatment testing, sorry, is this green area right here on the south shore of Bay Jimmy, really facing open Barataria Bay, not in Bay Jimmy proper, but on, on the, just the outside of it. Orient yourself north is now to the left. This kind of shows that test area and study area that I'm going to talk about. You see that heavy oiling band along the shoreline. These are some of the test plots being, whoops, thumb's too big. Some of the test plots being set up. And I'll talk some about reference areas as well. And what we try to do is get an area as close to this, on the same shoreline, as close to this heavily oiled area as possible, where conditions were as similar as possible, um, but with either no oil or less oil. Kind of shows you some of our uh, test plots set up, all those different colors and number, different colors or different uh, tests different treatment that treatments that we tested. Can I show you another look at what it looked like during setup, what it looked like from the ground. These test plots were about 50 square meters each, about 500 square feet, so large enough where it was meaningful in terms of testing, but so where we all could also could have a nice control of what we were doing. And we tried a lot of different things, and I'm not going to step through all these. I'll, I'll skip through a lot of this and just show you quickly the photos. We tried um, 
cutting out that oil vegetation mat with weed trimmers or weed whackers is a really common thing that's done in oil spills with oil vegetation. We tried raking, just kind of show you before, after raking, before, detail shot, after raking, you see all that moves for emulsified oil on the marsh surface underneath exposed by the treatment. A lot of these things didn't really work. We were seeing that mat reform. We tried low pressure flushing. We tried flushing combined with raking to try to get a little bit more exposure to the flushing on the oil. Didn't work all that well. We tried um, some chemical treatments, some surface washing agents, lift and flow agents, not dispersants, but stuff that would help lift that oil off the marsh vegetation and off the substrate. Again, moved a little bit of oil, but not very effective. With all the flushing techniques, especially after raking, we find we're also washing the marsh sediments or soils off the marsh as well. Negative impact we were trying to avoid. We tried, uh, actually there was, a, there was active cleanup operations going on, going on with um, vacuum treatments, um, vacuum units, trying to remove that mousse from the marsh surface. We thought we'd try that in the testing uh, framework as well. We found, one, it wasn't very effective. Two, it was removing a lot of marsh soils. It was creating depressions in the marsh that the oil was then running into, penetrating deeper into the sediments. We turned those operations off as a result of our testing activities. And what we found that really worked best was a manual treatment that was a combination of raking and cutting, but raking with a different tool. Essentially a hedge trimmer on a pole it could effectively cut out those uh, oil vegetation mats and where needed, where the rack line was hardening, we could cut that into sections, remove it by hand, and we decided to, um, that this looked effective, we decided to monitor it a bit. This is what it looked like immediately after treatment compared to that to the photos I showed earlier in your mind. That's what it looked like a month later. And you'll see here, here's another one of those test pits in the marsh where we where were seeing a, a distinct moose layer before. We don't see that now. A lot of the oil on the surface is starting to weather. My thumb again, uh, starting to break up into, into patches. So this looked pretty like it might be, might, might be a, an approach. Compare this with no treatment. This is the actually even two years later with no treatment. Still have that vegetation mat, a lot of oil and, and mixed with sediment on the surface. Still that thick moose layer underneath the vegetation mat. So no treatment really wasn't, wasn't much of an option here. And this shot also gives another idea of what happened with no treatment. This was after Tropical Storm Lee in September 2011. The small plots that we did not treat had oil remobilized by the storm activity off the marsh surface and spread back further deeper into the marsh, tens of meters in, you can see it even pretty far back there. And pretty surprisingly, where we had treatment plots, those manual treatment plots with the raking and cutting located almost directly adjacent to our controls, we didn't see oil remobilization at all. So our treatments looked effective, at least in terms of oil removal, or, or not complete removal, but re reducing the amount of oil and helping the oil that remained weather and break down more quickly. We scaled this up for operationally. We used three platforms. Um, people on foot, on walk boards, on boardwalks on the marsh, doing it by hand. We also scaled up to some mechanical treatments and did a combination of manual only, mechanical only, and manual and mechanical combined. Just give you a, an idea in some of those photos of what some of the mechanical treatments. We we're trying to mimic those same manual methods but with larger equipment to try to make it more efficient. And we'll compare these two techniques, manual versus mechanical, a bit later. And I'm not going to go through all of this, but the top line talks about how much area we treated in Northern Mediterranean Bay with these types of methods. About 11 kilometers or seven miles. Um, we treated a few other areas in the Biloxi marshes, a few over in Terrebonne that had similar oiling conditions, but the brunt of it was in Northern Barry Terrier Bay. And kind of to put that in context, that's about one to two percent of the toil, total oiled marsh shoreline in the Gulf during this event. So this is only applied in targeted areas where the conditions were really bad. A lot of the other areas we left for lower intensity treatments like low pressure flushing, but most of it was left for natural attenuation. And I kind of have this caution at the bottom, the last bullet there I'll draw your attention to. Those intensive treatments that I've just shown you examples of were really only applicable for those most heavily oiled areas. Under this do no harm type approach and philosophy, you would, want, you would not need to, nor would you want to apply those in areas either with lighter oiling or even areas with heavier oiling where the oil wasn't as persistent, wasn't as severe as what I showed in these photos. Because you really do run a risk 
of doing additional damage. This shot again shows the red areas as they evolved over time as we got more information where those heavy oiling areas were. And all the yellow areas, that's at 11 kilometers where we treated intensively uh, with the combination of either manual or mechanical methods. Then we'll take it back to our test area where we track that over time. Uh, so first thing we're going to do is look at the first a year or two after the event, after the treatment as well. We're going to focus on um, vegetation and erosion. So our study design here and our graphics will be set up this way. We included reference sites with uh, lesser to no oiling and intact vegetation communities, heavily oiled areas with mechanical, with manual treatment, mechanical treatment, or no treatment are basically our controls. And then we added an additional experiment uh, in the middle of this where we also took mechanically treated areas and compared areas with and without vegetation planting and replanting immediately after treatment. We'll talk about some that some, especially in terms of erosion. Parameters we'll talk about here, um, we looked at vegetation, cover and species composition, uh, benthic animals like fiddler, uh, fiddler crabs, marsh periwinkles we talked about. I'm going to skip those from this first two years. We'll touch on those in the two latter years at the end. And we'll talk about marsh erosion. When I say erosion here, I really mean shoreline retreat or, or, or the, the, the retreat of the marsh shoreline back. Shows our study area again, the different colored squares are the different treatments, and then the different colored circles are the areas with and without planting in that, in that second study. And then our reference site is off to the right at the bottom, as close as we could get it, and very similar in all conditions except for oiling conditions. So we'll talk about vegetation first. This is Spartina alterniflora, the main species in the marsh. All these uh, graphs in this second uh, set of slides are, are going to set up, be set up the same way. Reference on the left, manual treatment, mechanical treatment, and no treatment for both years. And what you'll see here is a major oil effect. So high cover values for Spartina um, in the reference areas, very low values everywhere else. But if you look across the different treatment types, first year manual treatment seemed to be doing best, second year same thing. So we've got a little bit of positive uh, response from mechanical as well, but no treatment, leaving the areas alone for natural recovery, not really seeing any. This slide shows shoreline retreat. In this set, we don't have data for the mechanical treatment sites, so just keep that in mind. Um, and what we saw in our reference areas was about, on average, about a meter of marsh shoreline retreat per year. And that matches pretty well with published um, background rates of erosion for this particular study site. If you look at the oiled areas, much higher, two and a half to three times higher rates of shoreline retreat in those oiled areas. But the thing we were real interested in looking at is how did the manual areas where we treated compared to the no treatment sites? Really no difference. So we were having a positive effect on oiling levels, some positive effect on vegetation, but the manual treatments were not too aggressive. We weren't causing more marsh erosion as a result of that compared to no treatment. It's just a segue into the planting area. This shows one of the planting areas probably about two months after it was planted. Doesn't look like much, but within a year it had filled in pretty well. And this is a shoreline retreat in 2012, so one year roughly after planting. And this uh, on the left is the controls mechanically treated without planting. On the right is mechanical treatment with planting. These again were heavily oiled to start with. This dashed line was the seaward edge of our planting plots. We set them back from the shoreline a bit because we knew there was ongoing erosion. So everywhere from here back was planted. And really what you see is a big difference between the two types. The erosion proceeded up to, whoops, sorry about that. Erosion proceeded up to the point where we encountered the vegetation edge of vegetation planting and stopped or slowed down. Continued to burn right on back into the plots where we didn't plant. And look at the axis here. I want to show you this four to six meters of shoreline retreat in this area. I'll take you back and look at the areas with no treatment, manual treatment, and reference. So what that tells me is not only did the oil accelerate erosion in these areas, oil affected the vegetation, less vegetation, more erosion. We added the mechanical treatment in, at least in these study sites, the mechanical treatment accelerated erosion even further. So that treatment, mechanical treatment in this case, was too aggressive. So conclusions from this um, two-year study, first two years, vegetation effects continued to be observed at two-plus years, 
um, after the oil came ashore, even with treatment. We saw some initial vegetation uh, recovery improvement with treatment, especially with manual treatment, but some with mechanical as well. Um, no increase in erosion rate due to manual treatment alone compared to our controls. Um, we did see that increase in erosion due to mechanical, um, but that erosion was reduced um, by planting immediately afterwards. And the other thing I didn't mention is we also had some instances of, of, of oil being mixed deeper into the sediments with the mechanical treatment, something we didn't see with the manual treatment. So really two negative effects there. You get oil deeper in the soils, it breaks down more slowly. That's another negative that you want to try to avoid when you're doing these types of, of treatment or remediation techniques. So what would we recommend in hindsight or in similar situations in the future? Manual treatment coupled with planting. We didn't have that combination here, but I just felt really strongly that planting was having a real positive effect. I think it could have been valuable in, in the manual areas as well. And this is just a photo summary that kind of puts it all together, probably hits those conclusions home a little bit better. So we have reference, top left, heavily oiled manual treatment on the top right. It looks about the same. Cover values were actually lower, but it definitely looks improved. This is no treatment. See a lot of oil and oil mixed with sediment still on the substrate. Different vegetation composition, and that vegetation looks very chlorotic and stressed in that environment. So a big difference between these two. And then in mechanical treatment here, we contrast planted with the unplanted. You see the big difference there. We're holding on to the shoreline a lot better and actually building back up some of those marsh soils in those areas we planted. I think the planting was, was pretty successful in this case. So the last section here will touch on the next two years through four years post spill. And we're going to focus on planting and we're going to talk about some of the parameters we skipped over before. Um, a little bit different setup on our study design now. We're comparing reference to heavily oiled controls, no treatment, to mechanical treatment, and then to mechanical treatment with planting. Subset of sites we use, same setup, same reference sites. This is another good photo summary. Kind of see in red in the foreground oil control, middle ground in orange, mechanical treatment, and the mechanical treatment with planting in the background in green. And you know, I kind of want to draw your attention to the vegetation stature, the texture in these two. This is not Spartine alternate flora, which is what you would want and expect in a salt marsh. This is Paspalum, more of a disturbance uh, associated species. Also a species that's a little bit more characteristic of um, fresher coastal marsh, not salt marsh. You see that both in the control and the mechanical treatment without planting. You see more erosion, all this erosion out in front of the mechanically treated area as well. And then you look at the planting area in back. Same mechanical treatment, but just followed immediately after the words with restoration planting. You see a big difference. Steps through some of the data that kind of backs that up. Just a transition slide showing some of the residual oiling in a control area on the marsh surface. You see some vegetation coming in, but it's not all that dense. This is surface oil cover. So this is oil, residual oil on the soil surface as a percent cover value. These slides in this last uh, bit of the talk are all in the same order. Reference, oil control second, mechanical treatment, and mechanical treatment with planting for both years. What we see is a nice trend. No treatment, mechanical treatment, mechanical treatment with planting. These two are almost exactly the same. But where we planted, we found less oil on the marsh surface. Now a lot of this, I think, was a physical effect of uh, the rhizome spreading, the shoots spreading, and breaking up that residual oil cover like I showed you in that preceding photo. But I, I would suspect we also had some below ground improvement as well, and we're looking at some of the oil chemistry to look into that, sediment chemistry to look into that further. So this shows our planting about two months after they were installed, and this was very low tech. This was hand planting of uh, bare root spartina, only about two to three, um, stems per meter squared, done by graduate students, very cheap, very low tech, very quick. Um, we had a lot of criticism, a lot of skepticism that this would not work. This is a, a sort of open bay facing rim, uh, like bay rim or, or marsh. Um, the prediction was that this would all wash away pretty quickly. It wouldn't really work. But this next slide is two years later. It filled in pretty nicely and was, was pretty stable. Even at one year, we had about 70% cover. Even more so here, so it actually worked pretty well. This shows Spartina alterna florida again. This is uh, you know, two years later, 2013 and 14. Reference not doing so well in their own oil controls or their mechanical treatment sites in either year. 
but uh, doing quite well, similar to reference in the areas we planted. We skipped over benthic and verbis earlier. We'll talk about periwinkles real quickly here. Uh, in the inset photo, that kind of shows what they look like. They're about an inch in size at, at the largest. Um, those ones actually have some residual oiling on them. Um, and it's maybe hard to see them, and this next slide will kind of show you where they all are. That's about 100 periwinkles per meter squared in front of one of the reference sites. Show the data, big effect of oiling here. So reference at about 100 to 130 per meter squared individual snails. Um, very low numbers everywhere else. But you do see a trend from no treatment to treatment to treatment plus planting in both years. So some positive effect, especially with planting. We think what's happening here is the recovery of the snails is just lagging behind that of the vegetation probably by several years. There's other critters in these marshes as well. There's the fiddler crabs rib mussels, there's a variety of others, and rather than step through each of these individually, that would take a long time and maybe put you, put you to sleep, um, we'll just kind of sum it all up with um, marsh invertebrate species richness. So um, component of diversity, species richness of these macroinvertebrates in the marsh, mainly crabs and mollusks, snails, and bivalves. Same setup, reference, and same, tr same trend for low control, treated to treatment with planting. And actually by 2014, the reference and the planted values were not statistically different. So kind of sum this up. Treatment coupled with Spartina planting improved the oily conditions. Bit of a surprise, but a positive result. Um, almost maybe like a phytoremediation type effect, even especially if you find that that um, um, applies to the marsh soil as well. Um, planting improved vegetation cover and composition, very similar to reference values. We saw some improvement in invertebrate, macroinvertebrate recovery, like the marsh periwinkles and the filler crabs. Um, improvement with planting, but um, we think the recovery of those organisms, organisms excuse me, may lag behind vegetation recovery, not too unexpected. And again, talking about recommendations, what we would do going forward, faced with similar circumstances, what we would have done in hindsight. Um, I think you know, data shows pretty strong evidence that planting should be seriously considered either as part of the response immediately after remediation or cleanup treatments or as emergency restoration done as soon as possible afterwards. Um, some conditions in Louisiana in this study area that really applies to that, we had very heavy oiling, we had a lot of the vegetation killed, knocked back, we had intensive treatment methods that could also damage the soils and the vegetation potentially, and we've also got um, highly eroding marsh shorelines to start with even before the spill. All those factors add up to planting being a, a pretty good, uh, pretty good thing to consider. Now, it wasn't really done on any wider scale during the spill until much later. Um, October 2013, CPRA came along and they've been playing this for several years. There was a lot of difficulty getting it worked through all the approvals. They planted a lot of these areas at that time, um, based on close coordination with us and, and kind of partly based at least on our findings and recommendations. The only downside was a little too little, a little too late. A lot of the areas that had lost vegetation had already eroded by the time that we got in there were able to do the planting. Still a positive step. The planting methods were a little bit different. I think that would be something good to compare in the future. They planted containerized material with mature plants on a much lower density compared to our uh, bare root um, hand planting. There may be some differences there. So summarizing everything overall, all three components of the talk. Um, no, treat, no treatment or natural recovery is still recommended for most oil marshes, especially light oiling or even heavy oiling if that oiling is not persistent and severe and there's not trapped oil that's, that's really removed from exposure to the elements. Um, if you find that you do need to do shoreline cleanup treatments, try lower intensity treatments first, low pressure flushing, passive use of sorbents. Ramp that up as needed until you find what's effective being careful not to go too far and do additional harm. Um, treatment testing may be uh, helpful if you're considering an intensive treatments or some form of alternative treatment. You're not sure what the outcome will be. Every spill is different, every situation is different, every shoreline is different to a certain extent. So treatment testing can be helpful. It was certainly helpful for us in this case. And uh, throughout the process, close coordination, monitoring, continuous adaptive management is really the way to go. Uh, we applied that both during the the testing phase of the work as well as during the operational treatments. We're constantly monitoring, constantly trying to refine those techniques and improve them. 
In our case here, um, that combination of manual raking and power trimming with a, with a new tool that we developed worked best and was not excessively damaging. Mechanical treatment was a bit too aggressive, at least in these study sites, having a couple negative effects, probably the worst of which being the increase, uh, further increase in erosion. Again, I feel really strongly that planting should be considered in these types of cases. We think we saw a really good response there. Um, the timing and method of planting can be an important consideration. And, and finally, I and mean, this may not be a surprise to, to this audience, but um, no treatment set aside or oil controls are really essential um, during any type of response like this, both for evaluate, evaluating your effectiveness of treatment, but also those possible negative environmental effects. If you don't leave at least a few areas set aside without treatment, you have no way to really judge um, how effective your treatments are or if you're causing additional harm. And, you don't, and if you don't have those, you don't really learn anything for the next time either. So for more information, we just had a paper come out in the last couple of weeks in the journal Plus One. It's open access. You can get it online, um, download it, whatever. I don't know what that is. We had a paper that focused a little bit more on the planting, especially in 2013 at the International Oil Spill Conference. That's a good source for a lot of oil spill science that people aren't real familiar with. And all their papers back to, the, I think, 1969 or so are available online as PDF versions. And finally, there's a NOAA technical memo that goes through a lot of the background on the treatment testing process, how it was set up, and all the operational treatments. And with that, I'll just put up an acknowledgement slide. The state of Louisiana was a big part of all of this, worked very closely with us. I was working with NOAA as a consultant, um, part of the scientific support team. Um, DEQ and CPRA in particular were, were a big part of this. Um, I also want to recognize uh, Tulane University, in particular uh, Bree or Brittany Burnick. She uh, led the planting component of the study as part of her dissertation work. She's getting ready to finish up here, I think, in, in a couple months. But um, she really came up with the, the planting idea and applied that and worked work together on it afterwards. So with that, I'll, I'll take any questions. Sure. Did you ever consider doing an intentional macro invertebrate uh, colony plot the way you could plant the Like introduce invertebrates into the area? Yeah, that would, that would be, I think, a, a neat study. And that's been done with some of the um, some of the insect work that's been done. They've tried that sort of common garden experiments where they set up um, enclosures and add insects in where they're not currently there and compare those to reference sites. Um, and Gene can fill you in or get you in touch with people doing that. I consider that a little bit for periwinkles and fiddler crabs. Um, it's, it's interesting, um, right behind that main heaviest oiling band, a lot of times there would be plenty of abnormal densities, uh, periwinkles and fiddler crabs and other marsh crabs. They just weren't coming into the oiled area. So I think, one, the lack of vegetation for something like periwinkles, without that vegetation, that's a critical part of their habitat. They're not going to move back in, even if they're present in adjacent areas. And then I think for some, for some point in time, at least, you know, residual oiling levels were, were still pretty high. Um, so I expect you know, part of the recovery process might be immigration in addition to new recruitment. But at least so far, at these study sites, we haven't seen a lot of that. Sure. Scott, do uh, you find any difference in your recommendations for the early response during different times of the season from your uh, manual location? Definitely, yeah. And, and there were, you may have caught a little bit of that in one of the slides. It's something I didn't touch on. We found with time, we talk about adaptive management, that uh, Treatment and treatments in winter were really the most effective. Uh, when it was really cold out, with the, especially with the manual treatments, the oil would get in more of a semi-solid state. It could be lifted out of the marsh a lot easier. Another advantage of winter in Louisiana is you've got wo low water levels oftentimes. You've got north winds pushing the water out. You're able to be in the marsh longer and, and under wet, less wet conditions. The vegetation in Louisiana really can grow year-round, but that's you know, certainly not the peak of the growing season. The plants are less active. A lot of the, a lot of the, the more plant um, nutrients or energy is in the below, below ground reserves, so it's a better time to be in the marsh overall. A lot of the critters, the birds, the marsh invertebrates, et cetera, are a lot less active sometimes in winter. So when we recommended maintenance, maintenance treatments going forward, basically areas we'd already treated that didn't need treatment, we thought at the time that we touched up on um, later on with light 
levels of this manual treatment, uh, we often were prescribing that only in winter. Uh, also with the work crews, considering temperatures, lightning storms, humidity, winter's a lot better time to work for, for their safety as well. So winter is really, if you can, if things line up for you, that's really the way to go. Gene? Yeah, it can, it can really vary depending on, on the situation, um, not just the vegetation, but the soils and the hydrology and all other aspects. But um, there's some literature out there about uh, different sensitivities of, uh, of these species, one to oil, but also to physical disturbance, and you would want to take both of those in, into account for sure. Brian, did you have? Well, I was just going to add to your comment about the timing when you do it. The other thing, the difference between summer and volatilization of the oil compounds in the summer it's going to be a lot worse than the volatilization so if you're distur physically disturbing the oil you're likely to release a lot more of those toxic compounds and, and in, in, in extremely you know, warm or hot condition as well when you're in there working with the oil it's harder to you know, keep it contained you know, keep it from spreading getting it on you you spreading it on the unoiled areas or less oiled areas so it's it's you know during those really hot temperatures it can be so winter has a lot of advantages if, if things work out that, um, that you can mainly do the work in winter. Um, another thing is you know, the time of spill, time of year of the spill can, can, can play into that seasonality as well. Oftentimes you'll see a spill and the peak of the growing season can be a lot more impactful than a spill, say, in winter for a lot of the same reasons. Back in the corner. Like you're talking about like a submerged type vegetation yeah. instead? Yeah, that could be an option. I mean, I know, you know, in some of these areas, if it's, if it's um, right salinity conditions, you can probably grow rupia, wigeon grass. Uh, there may be some other things. Yeah, yeah. Um, that might be, you know, there might be some phytoremediation you know, advantages there too. I don't know if that's really been looked at. There's someone at LSU, I think, who studied wigeon grass a little bit and how it relates to to oil spills and that type of thing. So someone's, I think, looking at that. Gene, Gene can hook you up, I think. I bet he's, he's smiling at me, nodding his head, so. All right, anybody else? All right, thanks. great set of talks. I hope that you all enjoyed them and that you learned something and maybe made some um, connections or ideas with dealing with your own work. Um, the next thing up on our agenda is we're going to do uh, an input session. So as I mentioned earlier in the day, um, a big part of our outreach, oil spill outreach program is trying to better understand and evaluate what your needs are. Like, on the job, what is it that you really care about? What would help you do your job better? What things are you still curious about? And what's the best way to give you that information? So if you uh, take a look at your name tag, you have a little symbol on there, either a star or a square, a triangle or a circle. So if you have a circle, could you raise your hand? All right, so you're gonna be going with uh, Jacqueline Rose. She's going to be facilitating an input session with you all. Um, so you can go to that, that back corner there. Um, if you have a square, could you raise your hand? All right, awesome. So you're gonna be going with Holland. And so Holland's going to be up front here. Your easel's in the very front. So you can just set it up maybe up here or the table, whatever. Uh, if you have a triangle, where are my triangles at? Triangles? 
Okay, great. So you're going to be going with Steve, who's back there in that, that far corner. All right. Stars. My stars. Okay, you're going to be with me. So we're going to be over there. So, um, you know, feel free to get some coffee on the way over to your, your group. And also, if you're ducking out, if you're exiting the room, if you could please put your evaluations over there on the registration table in that clear basket, I'd really love your feedback. So please be sure to do that before you leave. All right, thank you so much. And we're going to regroup at 2.50. Report back out. <laughs>